Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm so close I could take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value taming, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to haters. Now they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. Is late, so I'm fired up. Yeah, right okay. Here. <laughs> we never do podcasts this late. Uh, folks, episode number 184 uh, with the founder of Papa John's Pizza. Uh, Papa John Schnatter is in the house here with us. It's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, uh, Adam. Yes, it's it's uh, we got we got a special project we're going to be doing today. We got a lot of things to cover with you guys today. Uh, one of the things I asked him if he'd be open to, and I literally, we just told him a few minutes ago, I said, would you open, uh, open to this idea of uh, we, in a minute, probably in about 30 minutes, so stick around, mm -hmm. we're going to order pizza from four places local, different names, all big names, including Papa John, and we're going to order the works, and we're going to order the pepperoni, I believe is what we're going to be doing, okay? And we're going to time to see who shows up the fastest, mm -hmm. and at the same time, we're going to have Take a bite or the look, what it looks like, and we'll have it on the camera. You'll be able to judge it. Sure. A person that's been in this, you were a founder of Papa John. It's not like you were, got hired or you're a CEO, yeah. you're the founder. And you're going to give your feedback on... Now, uh, is Papa John going to do a blind taste test and see what ooh, he thinks? I think ooh, blind. we throw a little mask on. <laughs> would be you tell us what the best <clears throat> is. Can you recognize? I feel like well, we could have some fun. We'll We're going to do this in about a half hour I or so. I think in about 30 minutes or stick so. Stick we'll around, guys. Yeah, definitely stick around. And then uh, we got a lot of things to cover. Obviously... The, the controversial story with you, I want the audience to hear about it on what happened when on the recording with the laundry, the, the marketing agency, all that stuff on how that happened where you're everywhere. Every time we turn on the TV, you're looking at an ad, you're watching NFL, mm -hmm. you're everywhere. Montana, man, you are literally everywhere to all of a sudden, boom. Yeah. After what happened with Comp uh, you know, uh, Colin Kaepernick and a kneeling in the commentary and a recording that came out and... The story afterwards, where not a lot of people have seen the story afterwards, what happened with the recording of the agency came back out. And, yeah, yeah. you know, that's the part that I think it's good for them to know as well. And then, look, the reality of it is, you know, you can love him or hate him. He went from zero to being a billionaire. And he had a Camaro, which he sold when he was younger to support his dad's business. And eventually, years later, he went and found the person that he sold the Camaro to <laughs> who had already sold it. And they eventually found somebody that had the Camaro. Mm -hmm. I think you bought the Camaro for $25,000. And the person you sold the Camaro to to help you find a person, you gave them $25,000. And you made it a Camaro day. And everybody that drove a Camaro got free pizza for the day or something like that. I, I heard it was $250,000. <clears throat> yeah, $250,000 yeah, yeah. to the guy he bought it. Right. $25,000 to the As person a finder's that, fee? that Referral found fee? the other one. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Papa John in the house. Let's go. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, for folks that don't know, if you don't mind, take a quick minute and give your background on upbringing, how Papa John's got started, and how it ended up turning into a multi-billion dollar company. Well, I, I think my two really heroes were my dad and my grandfather. Uh, my dad was a, a serial entrepreneur, had probably nine or 10, 11 businesses, and every single one failed. So we had these bankruptcies, these financial issues all around the house, and my grandfather who was more conservative, he had three businesses in a law firm and they all prospered. And so how blessed was I to have the dichotomy of being in a family that's literally broke, a year behind on the house payments, turn off electricity, mm. turn off the gas, to over here where everything's paid for and it's safe and it's prosperous and he gets a new Cadillac and a new car and a new house. So it was that dichotomy that take the risk, you know, you gotta if you if you're an entrepreneur, which I am by spirit, Take the risk, but if you make that risk, you take that bet. You better make it good. Like so, so, so you saw them uh, on eleven businesses with your dad, as well as your grandpa. At what point did you say, "Look, my dad built eleven, constantly struggling, yeah. didn't happen." You know, maybe I don't want to start a business. Maybe I should just go be a safer job. Maybe I should go do completely. Maybe I'm going to be a salesperson. What made you say, even though you saw all the struggles with your dad? I'm still going to start a business. I didn't know. Um, I had a grass cutting business when I was eight, nine years old. I had a paint and gutter was when I was 11 or 12, a little paint company that my grandfather and I started. Um, worked through high school, worked through college, uh, had Central Solar help with my dad, uh, various companies, but really didn't know I was an entrepreneur. And I got back from graduating college at Ball State and I couldn't find a job. And my father had a bar that was bankrupt. 
50 cent uh, beer joint, mixed lounge, rough. Bikers, fights every night. Everybody's drunk. Legit. Legit. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're going to get in a fight every night. <laughs> mixed lounge. And John, this is in Indiana? Is Indi- that where you grew up? Indiana, 1983. He's going bankrupt. He's $64,000 in debt, selling 50 cent beers. Wouldn't know if I'd come in and help him. And we're not 10 days into this thing. And I said, Dad, I don't, uh, he thought he was $10,000 in debt. I don't think you're 10 grand in debt. I think you're 20, 25. Now I ended up being 64. And he said, Well, um, and you were 16 at this time? I'm 21. Okay, got it. 21. Got it. Got it. 83. I'm 21. Um, And I said, No, Dad, I, I think I can do this. And he said, there's no way just he was an attorney, he was a prosecutor, youngest city judge. Please just help my reputation, do what you can do, and just let the thing go under. And I said, no, Dad, I, th- I think I can really do this. I can fix this. Now, that was 10 days in. It, it just was like um, I made good grades in school, pretty good athlete, um, but I worked harder than the other kids. I mean, I always had to do things a little bit. This, running the business, was like falling out of this chair. Mm-hmm. It, it was the most natural, make the beer cold, have good people serving it, smile, clean mm-hmm. the place up, make sure the McBurger's hot, and uh, have a pool tournament on Sunday, a Euchre tournament on Tuesday, Little Kings uh, on Thursday. But it was the most intuitive things. And we're $64,000 in bankruptcy, Labor Day weekend of 83. I sell the car for 2800 in October of 83, we paid off $32,000 by January 1st of 84, and Clark County State Bank loaned me the other thirty two grand. In less than four months, we went from bankruptcy to solvent. Wow. Yeah. It was just a, it was just cool. a, it was my gift. That gave you confidence. That gave you a little bit of confidence where maybe I can operate a business. I was confident. Okay. <laughs> Got it. So that's the, so your struggle wasn't being confident. Um, it was when I went in. Okay. It was before I went in, but after I went in, it was like, okay, I, I can run a business. Mm. Um, and your dad was a, just couldn't figure it out, but you could at 21? And he was a grown man, <laughs> judge, lawyer, and he just couldn't operate a business, but you came in at 21, hot shot, and figured it out? How did that work? Yeah, dad was just, he was happy-go-lucky. He loved the racetrack. He believed in ab- absentee ownership. He thought the thing would run itself. Hmm. Whereas Papaw was save every nickel. You know, a penny saved is a penny earned. You have to be there. You have to tend to the shop. But entrepreneurship runs on all four sides of the grandparents, all four. So entrepreneurship was in the blood. I just didn't know it. That was your original question. When did you did you know it? I, mm-hmm. I didn't until I got thrown in the the lion's den in a pork chop suit and uh, survived. I love it. So you pay, you help, now you're solvent. At what point do you leave and say, I'm going to go do it on my own? We're December, January, 83, 84, Mm -hmm. and um, my dad had a joke. Um, John gets him drunk at night, and I get him divorced in the morning because he was an attorney. (laughs) I hated – we were good. Great business model, by the way. (laughs) I hated the bar business. I hated the drinking, the smoking, the fights. Um, You're really doing something that's a negative uh, impact on human beings, which is part of my soul that I just di- totally disagree with. And I had this idea for a pizza place when I was up in Muncie, Indiana, because I'd made pizzas at Rocky's Sub Hub and also made pizzas under Chris Caramacini, the Greek, at Greek's Pizzeria. So I had all the recipes and the, uh, the design of the place and the logo. And um, I think it was March, February, March, I go, I know what I'm going to do. <clears throat> I'm going to bust that uh, broom closet down that wall. And I'm going to put me some used restaurant equipment in there. And I'm going to take that box with the, the recipes and the logo. And we're going to do $5 pizzas out the back and 50 cent beers out the front with a 50 cent game of pool. That was our business model. For five bucks pizza, mm-hmm. 50 cent beer, and 50 cent game of pool. 50 cent game of pool. And, and we, got, we got the pool tables up to 1000 a week. I used to go in the bank where they had a machine. $1,000. Uh, That's 2000 games. Um, in quarters. In quarters. In each hand, the girl, the girl behind the counter, the bank teller was kind of <laughs> cute, and I'd walk in with five hundred dollars worth. Of, and uh, sounds of like how Ricky Aguilar <laughs> would pay me in quarters. And we were doing pennies, and then we're doing three grand a week in pizza sales in the broom closet, and we're doing seven thousand a week selling fifty cent beers. We're knocking down one hundred twenty four thousand dollars a year selling five dollar pizza and fifty cent game of pool and fifty cent beers in nineteen eighty four. 
Wow. So, so at this point, have you made pizza before? Is this That's your first? That's all I've done. That's all I've done. Okay. Since I, was, I made pizzas when I was, because we were talking outside is, um, I was a dishwasher at Rockies, uh, 235 an hour, uh, 1977, 78. 235 uh, an hour. That was minimum wage. Um, and I hated washing dishes. And right across from where I washed dishes is where Joe Fondrisi made pizzas. And the Fondrisi brothers, Joe, John, and Frank, ran Rocky Sub Pub. And I always dreamed of getting uh, promoted from washing dishes to making pizza. And they got it right up in the Saturday scene in Louisville. Uh, Joe Fondrisi went to the front of the house to host us. And John Snyder, Papa John, got uh, promoted from washing dishes to making pizza. And I fell in love with it. I loved everything about it. So how, how much different was the pizza that you were learning from them versus how you adjusted it to your style? What I did is I went around and stole everybody's best ideas. Okay. I went to Gaddy's. Um, they did some things with, with the cheese. Uh, Chris Caramassini, uh, the Greek, he had a little sweetness in the sauce, a little sugar that I wanted to increase the acid sugar ratio with our uh, vine ripened tomatoes and Papa John's yeah. to make it a little sweeter. Another thing I learned at uh, uh, Greeks, we do 8,000 a week in pizza sales and um, Rockies. We do 8,000 a day at Greeks because it was college. So Greeks taught me the sauce and the processes for high volume. Uh, they had a bakery in town, Crawl's Bakery. We used to study what they did with the crust. Um, Domino's went over and took a lot of their systems away from them. I was an employee at Domino's. So we just went around everywhere. I was a, I flipped hamburgers at Wendy's uh, in 1980. So we, we just went around and stole everybody's best What'd idea. What did you learn from Domino's and Wendy's? What did you pick up from them? Domino's systems are uh, and were incredible. <clears throat> they just had a, a processes where the efficiency of getting that order, getting it made, getting the oven, and getting out the door were second to none. What was the second? Wendy's. Wendy. Mm -hmm. Wendy's, what I learned from Wendy's. I don't like grease. <laughs> the grease coming off those hamburgers gets in your mm -hmm. face and your hair. You go, you go work at a Wendy's old fashioned hamburger, and you'll kiss the kitchen floor of a pizza giant, a pizza a Papa John's, because the flyer. Who cares about flyer but grease? So, um, mm. what I learned from our David, who learned from Colonel Sanders, was quality. Um, you know, quality is our recipe, and we used to patty the beef in the back of the store. Mm -hmm. And uh, our David Thomas was a fanatic about quality, and um, you know, we had him speak a couple times at our convention. Uh, he was a really uh, he was simple guy. wasn't um, you know wasn't been, wasn't a big talker. wasn't didn't use big words, uh, but you always knew where he stood uh, with him. And of course, Colonel Sanders uh, is 15 miles down the road from where I grew up. All these guys early on: Jim Patterson, Sanders. Did you Art, meet with all of them at that time? I didn't meet the Colonel. I met Patterson. Got it. Got it. Of course, Ken Taylor with Roadhouse. Jim Patterson. Who had the strong? Who had the most impressive personality? Like, who did you meet and say, "This is an impressive person here." In the food business? In the or in food Jeff? business, yeah. Patterson. Patterson. Patterson did, the only one of any of us that's done multiple, Patterson did Long John Silver's. He did Wendy's. He did Chi Chi's. He did Rally's Hamburgers. He mm -hmm. did Fudge Ruckers. He's the only one of us that really, Ken Taylor, you could say, uh, who just passed away this past year with Texas Roadhouse, he did Bubba's. And Jaggers, he did a couple, but well, they haven't really grown into anything big yet. But I mean, Colonel Sanders was kind of, um, you know, chicken. Our David Thomas was a, a franchisee for KFC and then became Wendy's. And then, of course, the only thing I've done is, is Papa John's and a few other things, the bar. But Patterson was the one guy that was <clears throat> multifaceted in his ability to do more than one concept. You, you know, Dave Thomas, the, the late Dave, Dave Thomas and Ray Kroc lived in the same community here in Fort Lauderdale. Did not know that. Yeah, before they passed away. Now, Both of them lived here. Great. great I'm glad you are. Croc's my hero. Yeah. Great Croc. Yeah. Behind the Arches, John Love. Croc, great, great book. Croc's the guy that figured it out. If that franchisee doesn't make money, then the mothership is worthless. I mean, he looked at everything from a, a franchisee perspective. He used to charge the um, the franchisees like a half percent royalty. Wouldn't even cover his overhead on supervising it. And it wasn't until Harry Stuborn came along in uh, – I think late seventies and the eighties, and came up with a real estate play where we'll, you know, we'll buy the land, build the building, take ten percent of the. He growth. was the business guy. Harry Stuborn was the guy that figured out the economics, but Ray was a salesperson. He, he was the visionary. He was the guy that said, "We can turn this into something big." 
he was a multi mixer. He was yeah. a milkshake uh, blender salesman. For God's sake, when he met Ray, uh, yep. saying Ray Kroc. Ray, Ray Kroc. Kroc when he, yeah. when, when Ray you Kroc. must have loved that movie, The Founder, with Michael Keaton. I mean, <laughs> that you. Uh, how many times have you seen that movie? I've seen it um, um, a couple times. I don't think it really embraces what Kroc was all about. Um, he, his his. I mean, he lost all his friends at his country club because they wouldn't uh, live up to his QSC and V. He was fanatical about quality, service, and cleanliness and value, um, and a character. You know, I mean, he, he liked to have a good time. But Croc, um, his, his. I mean, remember Croc uh, McDonald's? What fit nineteen fifty five, nineteen sixty? Hell, Burger Chef had been around 20, 30 years. White Castle had been around 20, 30, 40 years. A Burger King, um, Burger Queen, all these concepts were way before McDonald's. And really? yet he came 20, 30, 40 years. Check, uh, check my Burger math. Burger King came out before McDonald's. I, don't, I know Burger Chef did. So, yeah. but, Bur- but check You're out. saying McDonald's wasn't the OG but, that McDonald's. we think it is as no. today. We think that's the original McDonald's, you know, a hamburger joint. Yeah, but he, he, by the way, he's right. Burger King came out before McDonald's. Wow. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know that. Did no, you know that? No. I, I had no, no idea. Yeah. McDonald's was late to the party, and Croc still kicked all the butts. I love that. Yeah, he kicked so the butts. You kind of relate to that? You kind of relate to the fact that, you know, pizza, a lot of these guys yeah. had been around for a while, and you came out and... Well, the thing <clears> we're <throat> most proud of is our team, you know, our people, and our product, and our team. Um, but remember, in our category, there's some 40,000 independent pizzerias. So you, when I came along, you had Domino's, Little Caesars, and Pizza. You had the three three big players. Now, all 40,000 independent pizzerias are wired like us. They they want to get they want to be John. They want to get through that window of mm-hmm. opportunity. And out of the 40,000, we've been the only one that can come out of that horse race and, and get to the top four. We did it. And that's just because of great team effort and great product. And I got to tell you, we leaned on the book um, "Behind the Arches" by John Love pretty hard. Did you Did you ever meet Ray or no? Nope. I've been up to Oak Brook three or the four university. times. University. Um, to go through the museum. I mean that the office up there has actually has a McDonald's in it with a, a pub because mm-hmm. he liked to drink beer <laughs> after uh, the day was over. But you know, um, your quality is only as good as your consistency. Very uh, systematic guy. Everything was about system with yeah. him. Everything and. I don't know when it was. One time, McDonald's tested out creating a uh, pineapple burger. I don't know if you remember that story. Yeah. So he said, one guy came out and said, let's sell a pineapple burger. You know how long it lasted? Like Apparently, it lasted like a couple of days. People hated it. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's probably not a good idea. So they would test some of the products. It would come out and then boom. Ray one time said 90% of the best ideas that we got at McDonald's came from bottom up. Would you, yeah. would you agree with that? Like, Was that also culture with you guys where a lot of your operators would say, hey, John, what if we do this, and what if we test this, and what if we do that? Well, I, I think you always got to look for new and better ways. The McRib sandwich was a franchisee of idea. The Egg McMuffin was a franchisee of McDonald's. Um, but I'm sure for every one or two great ideas, they may probably had a 1,000 bad. But when you start running your business from the C-suite, and you're not out in with the franchisee store level, um, uh, the suppliers, if you're not out – looking on what's going on in the real world and learning, then you're not going to innovate and get better. The first, Y'all just ordered some pizzas from Jets and Papa John's when I walked in, and the, the driver of Papa John's hadn't busted me yet. And I asked the guy, I said, hey, is the pizza any good at Papa John's? He goes, nah, not really. And I was like, floored. He has no clue who you are yet. Not, well, mm. he did after about three or four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I go, hey. Can you imagine <laughs> how fun? <laughs> That's hilarious. And I go, really? He goes, yeah, it's not too good. I said, do you eat it? He goes, I don't eat it. But I'm like, you know, three or four years ago, a driver would have never said our product is something he wouldn't pride home. A driver saying that. Driver of Papa John's just told me in the lobby, he says, you know, it's not very good pizza. So I got to tell you this. So for me, here's here's my Papa John, uh, here's my Papa John's experience. Are you a pizza guy? Or like, do you have one that you order? Like, by the way, if you're listening to this, just out of curiosity, what's your pizza like? If you're going to watch a game on Sunday, mm-hmm. if you're going to order pizza for your kids or yourself or your family, what are you ordering? What's your number one place you go to? What's yours? I, I mean, uh, I don't want to go too long on this story. I had a pizza place in South Beach called Pizza Rustica. Mm-hmm. And when I was going in my heyday and partying in nightlife in yeah. South Beach with Keith, I would go out. I was I had no money to my name. I would go out. I had five dollars in my pocket, and I would go out and party in South Beach. I knew all the, the bartenders and the owners and the clubs and the promoters. I would go out, and you, this, you're going to shock you, get wasted, for free, have fun, great times at South Beach. I'd spend five dollars at the end of the night. 
uh, on a slice of pizza. And then uh, I ballooned up to about 235 pounds, the biggest I've ever been. In you have my, pictures? Uh, I burnt them all, but we're gonna. Um, if anybody is a friend yeah. of Adam, and you have those pictures. DM me right now. I'm gonna share it with the audience. Anybody Finders want to know? Exactly. Finders anybody Give me the worst Beach. one. Two thirty five yeah. is what we're looking for, not two thirty two. No, anyone in South Beach. Let me Beach, tell you my Papa John story. Rustica. So here's yeah. what happened with me. So I'm in the army. We lived in uh, Van Nuys, down the street from Basit, uh, uh, a Little Caesars. So I was a Little Caesars guy. In the 90s. So if I'm in uh, Van Nuys with my dad, hey, dad, let's order some Little Caesars. We go down the street, pick it up, and boom, boom. you come back. $5 hot and ready. And, and now they had the Little Caesars. What was the bread? They had something that was... Uh, the crazy bread. The crazy bread. Yeah, it was great. Anyway, so I go into the Army, and I'm in South Carolina, okay? And then we go to uh, 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 Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I'm in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I said, guys, let's order pizza. I said, yeah, perfect. Let's order Papa John's. I said, is that a local place? No, everybody eats Papa John's. Said, I've never heard of Papa John's. So what are you talking about? I'm in California. I've never heard of Papa John's. He says, dude, it's the best pizza. I said, Papa John's? Yeah, I'm not ordering Papa John's. What, is there Little Caesars? Dude, just try Papa John's. So they bring Papa John's. This is September of 97. You remember the date. I tell you, I, I can tell this. you this because it's the, like when you go boot camp and AIT for six months and you don't eat pizza, the first time you eat pizza... It's like a 16-year-old boy for his first time experiences, you know, the magic of, you know, what you call... Some crazy bread. Crumb, crumb, some crazy <laughs> bread, yeah. So anyway, so I eat this Papa John's pizza, but what, what, what got me hooked wasn't the pizza, John. When I dipped that pizza into that garlic sauce that you have, game over for me. Mm. I said, this is, since September of 97 until today, Dylan will tell you. You, yeah. ask, you call my family right now and ask, what's daddy's pizza? They'll tell you Papa John's just because of that sauce from September 1997. Whose idea was a garlic sauce? Well, the two little add-ons we give to the consumer uh, to say thanks are the pepperoncini and, and the garlic sauce. Yeah. Pepperoncinis came from the Fondrisi Brothers at Rockies, and um, that was just a nice little touch they did. They did. The garlic sauce came from a local independent pizzeria in New Albany, which was two towns over. And the problem with that garlic sauce is at, at Mix Lounge next to the broom closet operation, we could mount that, we could uh, melt that margarine, put the salt and uh, the garlic in there, fill up these little cups, and then put it out with every pizza because we're only selling, you know, five, six pizzas a day. Well, we started getting busier, and this garlic uh, sauce issue is a real problem because the garlic sauce is getting everywhere. And, um, we couldn't figure out how to pour it in. <clears throat> so we went down to the um, local funeral home because that garlic sauce will eat through rubber hoses. We used to get the hose from Hoosier Hardware, a little mama shop, a hardware shop in, in downtown Jeff on Spring. Went to Coot's funeral home, and the um, <clears throat> fluid that you get out of the body, mm. that, won't, it, that garlic sauce won't tear that tube up. So we put a five-gallon bucket up there with that um, tube um, that they use for dead bodies, and we'd fill up these garlic sauces, and we'd line all the cups up. Well, that worked until we got up to, you know, 30, 40 pizzas a day, and then that sauce was going in everywhere. And so store number three, we got rid of the garlic sauce. We said, that's it. We don't want to do it. It's too big of a mess. Plus, it's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Customers raised cane. They went up. They, got, they went Good nuts. Good people. And so we had to put it back in. <laughs> God we bless those people. Yeah, yeah if I, um, that, that garlic, I figure we sell, you know, 200 million plus pizzas a year. That garlic toss has got to be 9 to 10 cents a cup. So pick a number, 15 to $30 million. In, it's uh, expensive to do. Um, but we finally found a manufacturer that could figure out how to get that lid to stick on that cup mm. without that garlic sauce going everywhere. Yeah, I mean, listen, when, when that sauce mm. is there, if they, order, if they deliver the pizza, what I, I will chase the guy down. And I'll say, I'm not taking a pizza until you bring that. And I want it to be hot. And so they'll go back and get it. They've never but, not had the garlic sauce oh, in the pizza. Jen, of course they have. They've that, showed up Plano, at the house? In Plano, two years ago. I ordered, I'm like, listen, I order pizza once every other month. If I do it, I'm doing Papa John's. Yeah. I want to enjoy it. I want it to be thick, cheesy, just fat is what I want. If I'm going to have a couple of these slices. Right? Thick. I want it to be thick. So anyways, one time a guy forgot about saying, no, no, take this back. I want it hot and I want it to be this. Anyways, by the way, for those of you guys that just tuned in, here's what we're going to be doing. Stick around. In a minute, we're going to have four of our team members come in here. Each of them is going to call a pizza joint locally here. And they're going to call and order two pizzas. Okay. And we're going to see how long it's going to take from the moment they order to deliver it. And then we're going to have Papa John right here. 
judge all the pizza by the looks, by the box, <laughs> by the taste, by the flavor, and then we're going to see what's going to happen. So do not share this video with any of the local pizza shops. Matter of fact, let's give a uh, location of where we are right now. This podcast is right now being done from Vero Beach. So if you guys want to call the people in Vero Beach, we're going to yeah. confuse you a little bit. We're Muncie, not in Muncie, Indiana. Beach. We're in Muncie, Indiana. Yeah, we're in Muncie, Indiana. So, okay. So at what point when you start Papa John's, okay, and... I think it's 84, if I'm, saying, I'm not mistaken, I think you started in 84, right? You started in 84. At what point when you started it, and it starts going through what it's going through, when did you say, boys, team, gang, we got something going on here? You know, something's taking place. When did you realize you have something special? Um, the psychology on this is fascinating. Um, at store number one, <clears throat> we go from the broom closet to actually open in a restaurant. Room closet, as I told you, is doing 3000 a week. We put a store next door to the bar. It's a freestanding store, and we put a sign on the door. Volume tripled. We go from three grand to nine grand. And we're like, that's it. we didn't know anything about marketing. We just thought if you had the best pizza, you'd win. Wait, wait. So you put what sign? <laughs> we just put a Papa John sign. We didn't have a sign on the broom closet. We had a, we pass out a brochure and say, <laughs> in the back of Mix Lounge, we didn't have any sign on the front door. We didn't understand that if you put a sign on the front door, sales are going to go up. Sales triple, triple. Now we got the bar doing seven grand a week, pool tables doing a thousand, and Papa John's next door is doing nine thousand a week. We're off to the races. I'm all pumped. I'm, you know, I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm excited. We go down to Domino's, which is about three miles down the road in Grants Plaza. I walk in there. I'm, you know. Hell, I'm, I'm 22 years yeah, old. Sure, we're doing nine thousand. Yeah. I said, "What are you doing a week?" You know, he said, "We're we're doing six thousand a week." And I just basically looked at the guy and I said, "We're going to kick your ass in the whole world." <laughs> you now, said that basically. 22 <laughs> years old. How I thought with one store because we were whooping them in Jefferson, Indiana, we were going to beat them. The, but I thought that way, which is crazy. Most people would be like. I was scared. I was like, no, if you can beat them one, one place, why shouldn't you beat them in the whole world? Then let's fast forward to 2000. We got like 18, 1900 stores. We're making, you know, 70, 80 million bucks a year. And I'm going through people like shit through a goose. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm, cause I mean, I'm not, I'm relentless. You know, I'm, I like the tenacity, the perfection. I'm on it. And we turn the corner. We're making, 70 million bucks a year. But in my mind, we were still broke. I was still back when dad's businesses were going under and they were turning off the water, turning off the gas, um, a year behind on the house payment. So mentally, I still think we're broke, even though we're not. So I got hired coach, you know, I'm still working with guys like, like the greatest, one of the greatest guys and the greatest coach in the world, Tony Robbins, who, you know, gives me advice. And so I've always had great coaches along the way. So I got this coach in 99. We're going through this and, you know, it's In 99, just, it's Tony. 90, it wasn't Tony yet. If it was Tony, I would have the issues I had. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm literally like, it's my way, the highway. If you didn't do it my way, you know, I was bad. It was, it was a benevolent dictator. Um, with an attitude. So 9984, you're 62 baby, 22, you're 37 years old, give or take. 30, 37, 38 years old. 37 years old. Okay. And at this point, are you wealthy? Yeah, we're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, so at this but, point, you're, you're. Yeah, I'm set. I'm okay, set. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't, it's still, you ask, store number one, I thought we were invincible. We we're going to beat Domino's in the whole world. Here we're our store 1800. Worth the company's probably worth a billion dollars, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think I'm still broke. I mean, you know, because you're you just you know you're that. But that's the and, right mindset, though. Uh, it, you want a little bit of that, but you don't want to be. Dennis Rodman operates out of the state of fear. Jack mm. Nicholas, Tiger Woods operate out of the state of uh, self esteem. Of pot. you want to operate, you want a little bit of fear. You don't want to be complacent, but you don't want to be that running the show. You want solid sense of self running the show. So I got this coach, and this guy's tough, but I didn't care because you know we and and so he says, looks at me, he says, "You're worth hundreds of millions of dollars." I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Vietnam's over." I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Vietnam's over, bud." I said, "They're not going to turn off your electricity. They're not going to turn off your water. They're not going to lose your house payment. You're not going to lose your house. Vietnam's over. You need to wake up." 
Hmm. And it stuck. <laughs> it was like, shit. <laughs> was that good counsel? I was a good counsel. Vietnam's been over since 1999. So, so meaning, in other words, let me interpret that to see if that uh, if I'm if I'm processing this properly. You stayed in wartime leader mentality for too long, rather than yes. learning how to be a peacetime leader. Since war was already done, and you can figure out better things you need to do to take the company to the next level, is that kind of what you're saying? I think I learned that you can operate from the worst in you, a fear, or you can operate from the best in you. His words would have been a dictator versus a statesman. You know, um, combative, collusive versus I want to know who this. I want to know who is this guy. Name not name guy or no? Is he well known? No, no, he's okay. not a guy. He's was he an author or no? I don't know if he had a book or not. I think he's got a book. Okay, cool. Cool. So he's, he's giving you that mindset. So d- did it hit you and did you receive it or were you still fighting him when he told you that? Were you like, I know what it I'm no, doing? It, it just, it was, uh, the finally the button clicked. It just clicked that, okay, you got store 1800, nothing wrong with going to store 3000. You make a great product. You've made your point. Now just keep, it just went from, they're going to turn off electricity. I'm going to lose the house to look what I can do to humanity with all this resources and good. How the, what it really changed was the culture where we, we always had a culture of integrity, quality, authenticity, win, win. We always had that in place, but we started to really obey a natural law and natural principles um, in fact, our Go Left program was based on principles, uh, universal law of mutual respect, kindness, thoughtfulness, uh, win-wins, um, compassion. Um, we, we really changed the, the company from kind of a transaction-based company mm-hmm. to more of a people transformation company. And that happened in that 01, 05 time period because that's when John changed, you know. And that was the most fun I, I ever had was um, really coming back in 08, 09 till 16 and 17. That was the funnest run. That was, see, <clears throat> from 84 to 93 was survival, just survival. Mm-hmm. I mean, biological. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you know, you, you eat what you can. Nine, 10 day. years of just trying to survive. Just trying to survive. What's your schedule like during that time? What are you doing? Oh, you're working, um, you're working. 12 to 14 hours, six days a week, and you're working a half a day on Sunday. We did take a half mm-hmm. a day. We, we would cut out at one or two on Sunday. By the way, that's from a CEO founder who also had a similar struggle story. That's like the kind of mindset you're like, all right, but, what kind of, but, how many hours have you been sleeping? By the yeah. way, by the way, this is why some people hate capitalism. Because who the hell in the right mind is willing to listen to this message and say, you want me to go 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week, and half day on Sunday for 10 years? Now I'm good, bro. Totally get it. But there's a reason why the man sitting here is a billionaire. It's not mm-hmm. easy to do that. It's very, very lonely, and it's hard. So, okay. So, yeah, 84, so 93 so is okay. survival. Uh, You're alone uh, now. Uh, next. Uh, 93, we go public. We go from where we can't hardly get $3 million loan from um, uh, National City Bank in Kentucky. Yep. Louisville, Kentucky, $3 million. What was your EBITDA when you went public? Do you like, remember? Like 30. I mean, okay. it was, it was a good it. EBITDA. Okay, good. Yeah. To where the company's worth $200 million. I think it was June, uh, June twenty sixth of ninety three. We go from where I didn't have five grand to go on vacation with hmm. the family to now I'm worth a hundred million bucks one day. But I still felt broke until we really turned on the measurement system and the new culture in oh three oh four. I didn't. We were successful. We made a lot of money. We took the stock from thirteen dollars a share. If you look at pre spit. Pre split, probably 130 bucks. 10x. It was, yeah, easy, maybe even more. I don't know how many times we split the stock uh, so many times. Um, but I, I, it was from the fear of failure back to the 99, 2000 story. It was like I was doing it because I was worried about going broke. So 20 years you're going uh, with this feeling. What was the first night you slept where you slept? So 84, you're doing this, you're starting it. When did you really sleep? Because there's a difference between sleeping and sleeping. I think you know what I'm asking. I think 99, 2000 was uh, 16 years where I really kind of went, okay, I can, um, I can get a good night's. I think that, yeah, I mean, I definitely slept better. Okay, after I, this is this is where I gotta interject here for a second. 
You're saying for 15 years you didn't even sleep. No, no not not no. didn't sleep. That's not no, what I'm no, saying. No, I didn't, I didn't say sleep, yeah. not sleep. I said sleep good. He said this was the first time that he really got a good night's sleep. Well, this, you, this, this, I mean, this goes back to your point. But do you know what it thing. is to f- sleep with that level of fear and paranoia and someone's after and what if we go out of business? It's a different kind That's of sleep. That's what I'm asking. That's what I no, want to tap into, kind of understand that nature. And, and by the way, here's the crazy thing. Even after you get the 100, 200, 300 million in the bank, right. because you've been in that state for so long, you still don't know how to snap out of that state. Damn. At least uh, that's my uh, experience. Uh, yourself, 16 years. Well, the we measure the sleep every night, so I'll probably know more about sleep today than <laughs> yeah. I did. Yeah, aura. But um, the aura rings. Uh, but I love you, it. I'm, if, I'm if, doing... you read, if you read the book, Why We Sleep, yeah. All you can do is read the first page. The amount of things that happen when you sleep are as far as repair. Um, I w- I'd say I slept, but really not um, in when you when you're in a state of fear. You're in the reptilian part of the brain. You know, it's we call it a brain regression, flight or fight. Mm-hmm. And you know, your 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 repair to your your body is done in the neural cortex, uh, cortex, the frontal lobe of your body. And I think good night's sleep is more about getting in the, the frontal lobe of uh, don't think that if you don't spend the world, the world ain't going to spin. Mm-hmm. Um, a position of, okay, I'm in this for everybody to win. I'm in this for the better event of humanity. I'm in this to better my community. I'm in this because we're proud of what we serve. I mean, I, there's a, a higher level of consciousness that come when you operate from – a position of compassion, thoughtfulness, than when you're operating because you're afraid you're going to get broke and you're counting your money every day. So, uh, but by the way, if you're watching this right now, in a few minutes, we're going to call four different pizzas and we're going to order two pizzas. And it's going to come in here. We're going to time to see who delivers on time. And Papa John's going to give us some uh, feedback on this pizza, how it tastes, how it looks, the design, the whole nine. And we'll do that once the live hits the number 35, which we're getting very close to. You hit that. Give it a thumbs up if you're enjoying this podcast so far. Subscribe to the channel. But I want to go back to this here. So, okay, at this point, just to put things into perspective, 2000, so 84, 16 years, you talk to this man in 99, 16th year, you're able to get some rest. You're enjoying yourself a little bit more now. So are you kind of sitting back and saying, I've been working in the business so much. Let me see about working on the business. Where do we want to go next? Is that kind of what happens next? Not exactly. Um, remember, Christ had 12 disciples and to preach the gospel. <clears throat> and up till about 88, 89, there was 10, 12 of us that we could get out and preach the gospel of what Papa John's was all about. Remember we talked about Croc, Sanders? Mm -hmm. There's a culture, a methodology, a a process, um, idiosyncrasies, and every kind of brand that are uh, intuitive, instinctive that you have to learn. We got about 17, 1800 restaurants in 97, 98, and we lost our quality. There's simply too many restaurants to go out there and check on that we did it. And so while we started getting John and had screwed on, we started moving things from a culture perspective pretty positive. Our product quality had suffered. And this would have been really the second time that the product quality had gotten away from us. So we had to terminate the CEO in 2000 and figure out a way. Who was the CEO? I don't want to say. No, no. Oh, so you're joking. It's so, not you. It's no, wait, somebody. The CEO. Oh, yeah, so we, when did you stop being a CEO? We stopped in 2000. Oh, I'm thinking you stayed CEO the entire time. No, chairman. Okay, so you stopped being a CEO in 2000. Yeah. Okay. Just so for you, your audience, you had a founder who originates a concept. You got a CEO mm-hmm. who runs the whole organization. Day to day. You've got a chairman of the board who runs the board, who the CEO reports to. And then you got a spokesperson, I Papa John. So I carry sometimes four hats and sometimes, like today, shareholder and founder, two hats. Mm. Um, so the quality. Who's the most important out of all those? Because this was the question that I had. The question. CEO is number one. <laughs> it's not. No, I, I have my opinion, and I'll he, I'll let him answer. But I don't think it's even a question. I think the CEO, um, with the founders' methods and ideology, assuming the CEO has the right mindset, mm-hmm. is a quality mindset, not a production mindset, and knows how to get the right people on the bus. And get them in the right seats. So anyway, I retired in 2000, and we couldn't figure out how do you measure a million pizzas a day. 
Hmm. And we fought, we worked on that for almost a year and had a tomato <clears throat> supplier out in uh, Modesto, came into Kentucky, and we set up till 2, 3 in the morning and figured out you're never going to measure a million pizzas a day. But what you can do is measure 65,000 a year in poll, like you do an election. Mm -hmm. And we set up a, a program to where we had uh, pictures and service and stop stopwatches in 40, 50,000 homes throughout the country so we could monitor the product quality and service. Now, it fundamentals in a business are like staying fit. You got to do your emotional, spiritual, and physical push-ups every day. You saw those product, the product came in from Jets Pete's and Papa John's. You saw that when you came in. To get that Papa John's product quality, which was probably a six or seven, back to when I left almost a nine or 10, because you're never going to get to a 10, but you've got to be above an eight, would take a year and a half wear and tear on me to get them back in shape to do that. That's why I fought so hard the first two years. Don't do this. Don't let this regime come in here and destroy your product quality and your service because once you guys lose, once you get 80 pounds overweight, it's awfully hard to get back in shape. Mm. So we fixed the business from 01 to 05. We had the culture lined up, had the measurement system lined up. We're back to quality. Uh, stock went from 10 bucks back up to 40 bucks. We're on a roll. We hired another CEO. He comes in, first thing he does, let's quality so soften, make sure the guys in the C-suite get their stock options, the people at the stores get screwed, starts making money on uh, the food service. So 08, 09, got rid of him. Came back in, stock 680 a share. Okay. And that's when we had... The, that was down from 40 at the top? 40 or 50 from the top. Now to 680 a share. This is October, November of 2008. Came back in, but now we have the lessons in 99, we have the culture in 2000, 2001, and we also have the measurement system. So within a year, year and a half, we have, we're mm. back on top, we have our go left culture, we're running our business on principles, we got great product quality, great service, we're the number one place to work in Kentucky for six straight years. We win ACSI Quality World 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 award in the pizza category 18 19 years the only restaurant chain to even compete with this that was better was chick-fil-a and so now we took the stock from 680 in 2009 to when i stepped down in 16 to 88 bucks a share wow whoa 13 fold. to 88 bucks yeah, a share. 13 so, fold so let me so let me ask you this question and i'm curious to know what you're going to say about this how much of it was uh the new ceos you hired that weren't uh, capable of doing the job and how much of it was the fact that you stayed as the chairman it was very annoying to be reporting to the founder because they can never be as good as you so you were always kind of almost not helping them out you were not because sometimes you can get in the way as the founder of the new ceo that you hire um yes yes and yes okay good okay <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> no i think well fair enough way to say that though you know if you're saying that um yeah, it's 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 a toughie. We um, how do you find the right man to marry we, your daughter? You know, it's like a, it's your baby. We groomed a guy um, between myself and the present CEO. The present CEO, of Papa John's, is Rob Lynch, and and the and the, the company's in worse shape than it was when I was there at six eighty a share. As far as product quality service today, oh, it's you're a, saying it's today. A, oh, I mean it's an it's a it's a, it's not like got a black cloud over it. It's got a death spiral. I mean, why you touch that stock at 85 bucks a share when the product uh, is bad, uh, the service is bad, your franchisees uh, are not making the money they were making, their traffic counts is down. Um, they, you, you, international comps, negative eight. Um, Russia, <laughs> it's in the tube. Um, UK's in the tube. China, when Taiwan hits, is going to be in the tube. I mean, there's nobody building stores in the U.S. You have no growth. Um, if you take their uh, Philadelphia franchisee two years ago, we're going to build 49 stores in Philadelphia. That guy's gone. He's not going to open any stores. The guy they signed up in Texas is getting ready to open 100 stores. I don't think he's opened any. Um, the traffic counts, uh, they've got brag about 18 million new customers. The traffic counts are like negative, pick, hypothetical, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12%. You know, if I was an analyst, <clears throat> I would say, give me the market's going to grow in outside of Russia, Poland, Germany. UK, China, 
How come international comps are negative eight? How come UK is in the tank? How come your traffic count in the U.S., you've got all these new customers, is negative? How come you've lost uh, the ACSI award the last couple of years? How's your franchisee doing in Dallas? How's they doing in Pennsylvania? And by the way, how much money did your corporate restaurants make in August? Just ask a question. What are your transactions? What did corporate stores made in August? If they would answer that question honestly, I bet the analysts, I bet they'd run for the woods. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're being very gentle about the way you're putting them on blast. It was very, uh, you know, the, the way you went about it. If they're listening to it right now, the founder who started this company is yeah. calling now oh. the product today with Papa John's, which we'll find out here in a minute right. when we order, because it breaks my heart, because I, you know, I've been, I've this, been, that's the garlic customer. sauce. Yeah, the, gar- well, the customer's qu- Question that. for you, Papa John. When you're saying all this, essentially kind of, throwing your namesake in in the mud are you disgusted by it does it upset you or you're like well you know when i was there maybe you're more proud of what you were able to accomplish like how do you feel basically saying everything you just said about the company where it's at now we've been through this now three times where every time i leave they get away from the principles they get away from the quality get away from their service uh get away from their transparency um but so is there an emotion that this... Of course that this, there's an emotion. What, what's that emotion, if you could put a name to it? Uh, you, the, first of all, you hurt for the employees. Because when this, this went down, this started three years ago, mm-hmm. four years ago. And they don't care about the employees. And we're not in the pizza business, we're in the people business. I mean, there's three, 400 families in Louisville that just got left hanging because they just picked up and went to Atlanta. Um, all the good employees that, that were there... 10, 15, 20, 25 years are gone. So no regard for people. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I tried to do is I tried to save the employees. I tried to save the franchisees. And employees, I, it was, they just moved so quick. You know, they just they didn't, they didn't care, and they wanted to cut G&A. Franchisees, I've been telling them for some time, hey, you know, pay attention to your food quality. We've been through this. We've seen this movie before. You get your service. And then COVID came along. You got a monopoly got a captive audience where people are sitting at home consuming alcohol you can charge a a higher number because people are trapped and they got free money entitlements and so this last two years they've had a free ride that's the worst thing that could have happened to rob lynch the ceo of papa john's because he thought it was easy he he had lazy he he was he got caught Mm flat-footed and now they let the product and the service slip image slip what they should have been doing the last two years is getting ready for this day when COVID's gone and we're back to reality, they got ca- uh, caught flat-footed, yeah. and now they're they're in a you know in a spiral downward because of the reason we just mentioned. And by the way, the same could be said for everyday Americans that were every all the entitlements you're talking about, the stimulus that you're getting, the um, free free money that was going out there. People got lazy, and then obviously uh, that, that, you the, see what's happening now. We we talked about this February March of 2020 on the interviews. The thing most dangerous about this is the psychology. Habits are formed in 18 days, yeah. solidified in 44, and in three months, it's a lifestyle. We've been sitting around for three years with free money. I, I worry about the psychology of getting free money and not have to make a contribution. Mm-hmm. You know, Socialism is taking from people that produce and rewarding to people that don't produce. Mm-hmm. That's what we've been doing for three years. Well, we know it doesn't work. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's an idea that... Um, it comes out of a, a place that's never been proven. No one's ever proven that this system works. And mm-hmm. America proved no system has uh, provided better innovation in the world than the concept of capitalism. No mm-hmm. country has done a better job uh, doing that than we have. So they can give their argument as much as they want. Hey, Pat, before yeah. we transition, I, I really want to get your feedback on that initial question I had. He said, you, you said, oh, there's no question as to who the most important is. I asked yeah. CEO, founder, uh director of the board, uh, the spokesperson, the president, you said no question. I did, And then he answered, I, I think you said the, the founder and the CEO, if they're in visions in line, uh, visions in line. What, what was your all, answer? None of these is as hard. Okay, who's got a tougher job? Biden, Trump, Obama, Bush, Clinton, Reagan, or Washington? Washington. There's not even a question about it. Who's got a harder job? You know, Tim Cook or Steve Jobs and Wozniak? It's not even a question to see... The founder. The founder has, it's a very, very, it's very, very emotionally taxing. Mm-hmm. And, and not just on you, on everybody in your family that's involved with you. Mm-hmm. Your, your spouse, your kids, your everybody. A founder's life is not a sexy life. It's just not. That's just the reality of it. 
There's nothing sexy about being a founder while you're a founder the first 10, 15 years. Said he got and no sleep for <laughs> no, but 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 it's not that. It's 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 a, it's a very honorable profession. It's a not very honorable uh, position to be in, mm. but it comes with a lot of burden. It's not the most you know. People think, oh, look at this founder. He's worth what he's worth. Oh yeah, go ahead, do it again. Well, matter of yeah. fact, you do it. I'll give you twice as much money as he made. <laughs> go ahead and do it. Go see. Well, go this see is what you sum- this is what you summarized in your ninety second video: the life of an entrepreneur, right? It's not for everybody. So when you run, you know, when you run into, if when I go and run into somebody that's got a military uniform on, I'll say, hey, thank you for your service. When I run into a cop, I'll say, thank you for your service. If I go to a restaurant yeah. or a small business where the owner is there, I'll say, thank you for your service. And so what do you mean by I was never in the military? Yeah, but you're running a business and you're creating jobs. And because of you, I get to pay less taxes because these people are getting paid by you, not by taxpayers like me. Thank you for your service. So more huh. people should stop by business owners and tell them, thank you for your service because it's not nice. an easy job. It's a hey, very Papa hard John, job to do. Thank you for your service. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah, there's no question. By the way, at the peak, how many pizzas were you guys selling at the peak? Peak, peak, when you were there, how many were you guys selling? I think we were right at a million a, a day, 360 million pizzas, something like that. A million pizzas a day. I, I know it was a crazy number one Super Bowl Sunday the last year I was there. I think... I think we did twenty million dollars or twenty million. It was a crazy number. Twenty million. I wasn't twenty million pizzas. Maybe it was twenty million bucks in one day. That was that's, like, yeah, that's intense. When well, we used to do, like we used to do two hundred dollars a day and thought we were rich <laughs> in the broom closet. But that's that's a cool thing though. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's the story. So look, let's let's address one thing. We're about to order the pizzas here in a minute, and then I'm going to go into some of the other issues that we got. But let's address one thing. So, um, all of a sudden one day, I'm looking at the news saying, you know. Papa John is stepping down, okay? Hey, he's resigning. The board is asking him to resign. He's choosing to resign. All that mess that took place. Then I said, how did this just happen? This doesn't make any sense to me for what happened. So, you know, America, we know we're all about innocent until proven guilty. Sometimes the media is more about guilty until proven innocent, which they take a different model than innocent until proven guilty. I listened to the recording I listened to the 54-minute call, whatever the 54-minute, I think it's a 54-minute Zoom or call that they had. I listened to the call that they had. I listened to their conversations. I read the manuals. You know, uh, I went through it to just kind of see for myself. Why don't you take a moment and, if you don't mind, share you know, what happened the day where you were essentially forced to resign from the company? Um, what led to those events? I think um, I knew something was up. When you when you when you run a business, you've got pretty good intuition, and they, you know, um, exacerbated the Obama comments. NFL, I said, hey, just solve it to the owners and player satisfaction. They painted that in the kneeling somehow. I mean, it just they did, kept doing it, and I'm like, and my company would never step in and say, well, that's not what he said. Just read the transcript. Unfortunately, everything I've done, there's a, a transcript, and um, and and there's no history of of race. There's no history of not treating everybody with kindness, with love, compassion, and respect. But I felt something coming that was going on behind the scenes. <clears throat> but I didn't think it was an inside job. I thought I thought it was coming from the DNC or from the outside. Mm-hmm. It ended up being it was a combination of both. Um, but when they they set they set this up with uh, laundry service, and laundry service leaked a, a false narrative to what I said. Actually, what I said was anti-racist, um, and they painted it as racist, um, mischaracterized it. The thing I asked the board is, I said, slow down. Uh, I can remember this coming down on a Tuesday. We had a board meeting. I said, just slow down. Let's make sure you all know what I said. You know my heart. You know there's no history of of this kind of, um, you know, mindset, behavior, uh, feelings towards anybody um, on prejudice. And I couldn't get the board to slow down. So Wednesday they said, hey, if you would step down as chairman, um, then that would solve the problems. Uh, one of the board members, Sonia Medea, called me the next day and said, you know, by stepping down as chairman, you, you saved the company. This is on a Thursday. And so um, – I stepped down more to just kind of let things settle down a little bit. And then on Friday, uh, they said, we're going to have an emergency board meeting on Sunday. And then Saturday that week. So less than six days, we went from where chairman, um, 
principal shareholder, um, founder, spokesperson, to where that Sunday they uh, they actually kicked me to the street. Um, um, not only that I was no longer chairman, I wasn't even in the office, and I lost my uh, employment agreement. So <clears throat> I think the thing, the lesson there is, as a, co- a company and corporate board member, you have a fiduciary duty to do an investigation, set up a committee and do an investigation and get to the bottom of what happened. This board, because I think I had some board members on board, I know I did, that had self-interest that wanted me out. Um, one of the directors, Mark Shapiro, the other director, Steve Ritchie, Mark Shapiro got a, a $10 million package and got the $40 million marketing business um, after uh, I was ousted as chairman. And Richie got a $6 million a year package because we were getting ready to terminate him for the reasons we talked about. So we had two board members that were uh, kind of on the inside, had a weak board, corporate board. They really didn't understand the business. I think they bought into a bad bill of goods with uh, Mark uh, Shapiro and Steve Ritchie, and they overreacted and did their corporate duty and just did a tremendous damage to the brand but not getting to the bottom of exactly what I said and not having some kind of defense in. And by the company not having any defense and not taking a position to support the founder, they're complicit. Yeah, and, and you know what's interesting? So I, I, I dug into this because sometimes as a business owner and you got strong opinions and you're vocal about it, you gotta be careful because you're a target and I'm somebody that mm-hmm. runs businesses and I have strong opinions and you know there are a lot of people that don't like that. So for somebody like me, I said, let me take you as a case study and I'm gonna look at, because there's many case studies like yours. I said, let me take him as a case study. So in 2012, I wanna say you're at an event and you made some comments about Affordable Care Act on uh, a class on entrepreneurship in a shareholder conference call. You said that you oppose ACS because your best estimate was that Obamacare was going to cost you around 11 to 14 cents per pizza. Okay. That, that's what the article wrote about you, what, what it says. But look at the context. Yeah. You kind of just did a little bit of what they do. I said delivery charge is 250 275 <clears> a pizza. <throat> yeah. Obamacare is only 12 or 13 cents. It's not a big deal. We can absorb it. I disagree with it, but it's not a problem for us because of our volume and the amount of transactions we have. Yeah, but but what I'm my point is, a businessman has to look at these numbers. Like you just said, like garlic costs nine cents, and if we're doing twenty million a year, that's you know two hundred million. That's a real money if if you're doing some number like that. You're saying three hundred sixty-five. Let's just say you do three hundred sixty-five million pots, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, pizzas per year. And each pizza has one of those garlic sauce, nine cents. That's number that you got to look at. You said fifteen Here's, to thirty million in garlic sauce, I believe. Well, depends on it, how many they it, do. If they do three sixty-five, it's more like you know thirty-five million, not yeah, yeah thirty-five million bucks in garlic. Yeah. <laughs> so, but 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 you got to understand if you're a founder uh, and you're the spokesperson, yeah. and if you say, "Listen, if my costs go up, I just pass them on to the consumer." The left will attack you for saying what I just said. But guess what? If you're in a business and the costs go up, you pass it on it the consumer. To. It has I, to. That's, yeah. I mean, to you and I, it's common sense. Yeah, it has to. Like to, right now in California, I don't know if you saw in California. By the way, I'll tell you what I did. I, I see you. Just so you know, I'll let you know. So uh, when I'm uh, one of the guys shows up here, a guy runs a restaurant in uh, Mexican restaurants in California. He's got 38 of them, Okay. So he said, did you hear about the new law that just got passed for restaurant chains with over 100 locations? I said, mm-hmm. yeah, I heard about it. So he says, this is going to impact us. I said, let me take a look at it. So I'm looking into it. I says, well, they're raising the minimum wage. Did you see the number? They're raising the minimum $22, wage. $22, I believe. $22 in California per employee working at a restaurant that's got 100, 100 chains or more. Okay. So if it's 15 going to 22, that's a 50% increase. And restaurants' margins generally are what? 3 to 5%. If a burger's 4 bucks overnight, it's $6. So if the customer says, I can't believe these guys are raising it, it's not these guys raising it. It's $22. That's the minimum wage that the price is being paid. Okay, so the guy at the business owner, has to, he's like, Pat, how do I handle this? I said, you have to handle it by being prepared for this. So you got to raise your costs and tell the, explain to the customer, here's what we have to do. Because he's simply having a conversation with the board to say, this is what it's going to cost us. I'm not offended by this. I'm expecting a guy to be talking about this because if you don't, maybe you're not the right guy to pay attention to these types of costs. So then next is you were at the Romney deal 
And I think you something happened with Romney at a fundraiser. You hosted a r- fundraiser for Romney in May of 2012. And you've said good things about Trump. I think you contributed towards him. And then there were some things that was in 2017. And then right afterwards, this event takes place, right, with your situation. So I, I, I said, let me go read into what you said. Because believe it or not, I thought this entire time you said the uh, the, the N-word, okay? Do you know the story with uh, how the, did you listen believe, to the recording yes, or I did. No? I did. I watched the whole thing. There was a Colonel Sanders reference. Yeah, I so, think it's important for him to address it. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, in 2017 on an earnings conference call, the NFL was hurting and more importantly by not resolving the current debacle, the NPA players, NFL players, satisfaction, NFL leadership has hurt Papa John's shareholders. Okay, fine. It's a call out to the NFL. They're not going to be happy about it. This should have been nipped in about a year ago. Fine. And then it says Papa John's founder used N word on a conference call. So like, what? So what, what's the context here? Mm. Then you see, hear the recording questions in the first place because you know it wasn't intentional, it was sensitive. But the word was even Colonel Sanders called blacks. Then you don't say N word, you say the actual word. And I'm like, I've never used this word before. So then it goes back and the marketing agency's recording comes back on what they were trying to do to get him down and hey, we just have to get him to speak the truth and you know, want him to write down bullet points and let him go. And anyways, the J- this guy named Jason, Jason Stein is saying what he's saying. Then you're kind of watching us saying, well, look, these guys were not necessarily coming from a place of trying to help you as a marketing agency. They were kind of coming from a place of seeing, hey, what can we do to you rather than help you? But to the market, unfortunately, in today's times, all they see is this guy must be a racist. And, and for me, this is how I view it. If let's just say you're somebody, we go to a bar, and all of a sudden you have a drink, and after a drink you look at a guy, he says something to you, punch him in the face. I'm like, what the hell was that all about? Then I call around some of your friends, and he says, oh yeah, Adam's known for that. What do you mean Adam's known for that? Adam does that all the time. Seriously? Yeah, one time we were in high school, he did this to that guy. One time we went to a club, he did that to that guy. I can tell you I've seen Adam do that 20 times. Well, guess what? There is a trend. Mm -hmm. But if this happens on a call like this, in 2017 and you've been in business since 1984 how many total w2 employees have you had all these years how many people would come out and say yeah he called me that as well he used that word as well he would do see that's the that's the investigative journalism that doesn't go that deep to show that and then all they do is people jump to conclusion and boom now you got somebody that's not running the brand which all of us if we watch sunday football who would you see you would see you know, yeah, Papa I've seen John, this guy's you know, face so many times yeah, in my so, life. So, the fact that he's sitting here but, is kind but, of funny. But, but, there, but there is a point here. For somebody that's gone through it, yourself that's gone through this situation here, we had uh, at an event I hosted last week in, uh, uh, not last, was it last week? Was last, last week we were in Madrid yeah. two weeks oh, ago. Last, I'm sorry, Vol- 10 days ago, we had an event at the Diplomat. And we brought Chas Palminteri, who did the one man show Bronx Tale. Oh, man. We had Robert Kiyosaki there. We had the number one illusionist in America, a good friend of mine, Frederick De Silva, there. We had Kevin Connolly from Entourage, the show Entourage. Andy and then we had Andy Fastow. I don't know if you know who Andy Fastow is. Andy Fastow is the former CFO of Enron, who went to jail for eight years. Wow. And he had 100,000 employees. Everybody's like, why would you invite Andy Fastow? I said, I'm trying to keep you guys out of jail. You got to pay attention to accounting. You think this is just making money? So he came up, and this is his opening talk, one of the best talks you'll see. He says, this is me. He shows the magazine. Your prior to this, I was recognized as a CFO of the year. The next year, this is my prison ID card. Okay, One year ago, I'm the CFO of the year. The next year, I'm this. And he tells his own story. So for some people that are becoming you know, maybe they have a business brand and they're not low-key. Maybe they have a following. Maybe they have a voice. Maybe they have some political leanings. Maybe they have some strong opinions. What feedback would you give to other founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs to be careful with in a climate like this where everything is so, you're walking on eggshells and it's a cancel culture type of an environment? What feedback would you give to operators like that? I think several. Um, one is people always usually ask in their own, act in their own best interest. You have a board of directors that hired a CEO that had an agency that sets the, the founder, the face of the brand up, and betrays the false narrative that is a racist. Uh, who in their right mind, <laughs> tell me how that's in anybody's best interest. The shareholders, the franchisees, employees, the founder, the board. 
it's in nobody's at best interest unless you're Washington and you want to head of the DNC because, you know, I'm involved with a lot of things that involve entrepreneurship. I mean, so from my perspective, there's no way I could have seen this coming because you wouldn't think back to the inside job that people would act in something that's so far in everybody's worst interest. The second thing is the, okay, I was set up, false narrative, shouldn't have repeated Colonel Sanders, but the intent, uh, the, it's a good heart. And, you know, slurs or anything like that, it's all about what you meant and what you felt. And and there was no nothing but um, love and kindness in the history. There's no um, history of this kind of repeated offense. There's no priors is what you're no, saying. No, of course not. Um, but let's get the two-inch violin out. Let's do a 10-second pity party for John. Now let's get on with life. Because the universe always works for me. It never works against me. Sometimes it felt like it. Now, why I had to go through what I went through to get to why, where I'm, why I'm sitting here, I don't know. But you got to take that position. And I look at California at 22 bucks. I look at Ukraine and Russia. I look at, um, you know, this labor market. <clears throat> for some reason, I, my, it was my time to get out of that situation. I wouldn't have done it that way. I'd have, let, I'd have given a decent bur burial, but it wasn't my choice. They overreacted. They panicked. They did a lot of damage, and they, it's done. It's done. They will be held accountable. So I think moving forward, you got to go, okay, what did I learn from that? And the, learn, the thing is, in your 90-second tape, you know, you wake up every day, and you make it happen. And so I don't know what the universe has in store for me. I can tell you the four principles, the four uh, characteristics is me that I want to have. Um, but that, that other opportunity will come along, and we'll do something bigger and better uh, for humanity that's better than the bar, better than the pizza. And, um, you know, my four criteria are it's got to be in my soul. It's got to be part of it. It's got to be authentic. It's got to be real. It's got to be truthful. Two is it's got to better humanity. If I'm not better than my fellow man, that's why I hated the bar. Pizza was fun. It brought friends and family together, but it's processed food. Let's face it. I want something that's going to improve humanity. I want something I can scale up because I like big stuff. I like making an impact. And fourth is it's got to be sustainable. I don't want to be feeding it every month. So until I come across those four things that are in my being, in my fabric of my soul, then I'll just have to sit tight and be patient. Remember, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm allergic to patience. So this is very <laughs> difficult to sit here for three years and not do a whole lot of anything, but I'm I'm doing it. Can I can I assume what you have been doing? Uh, when you when you were going through all this, uh, permission to speak freely here, you didn't look your best. You were probably thirty pounds heavier, forty pounds heavier. You look great right now. So I assume you've been working on yourself inside, outside, emotional, physical, all that fun stuff. You know, people kind of go, you know, when this went down, did you hit rock bottom? And the answer is no. Because the people that did this, I loved them. I loved them and I protected them. And I, I mean, I made them all multi-millionaires. This went down July of 18. It wasn't until January, February 19, where I finally had to come to grips where they really did do this. The people that I really care about, really, it was so painful to see that I would just go blind. I wouldn't see it. And that was, that was the hardest moment um, I don't know, January, February, March of 19, whereas these, these people really did this. I mean, they, did, they painted me as a racist. I mean, can you imagine being the founder, the spokesperson, taking that thing from 640 a share to the company's worth $3.5 and, and the people that are around you, they're supposed to be protecting you, hired an agency and set you up. As, I didn't want to see it. And so I, I, you, had to get, you had to get back to get out of denial and get right back to they did it. Now, <clears throat> from there... You keep harping on it. Um, you're angry. You're jealous. You're vindictive. Well, shit, that's no way to go. So you just got to kind of go, all right, I forgive them, but I didn't forget their name. <laughs> you're whatever you're, wherever you're no at. No question about it. And, you, no. you know, you just move on and you just start trusting the universe. You trust in a higher power and you just know that, um, you know, there's something bigger and better lying ahead. You know, uh, uh, pizza, when you hire pizza employees, they don't have. MBAs. They don't have. They hire people like me. Like when I was eighteen, I'm working. I'm, I'm going to be working at places like that, right? So, I'm not somebody. I'm Middle Eastern. So pizza people hire what minorities. That's who you hire. So, 
he, you've had many, 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 many chances to offend those communities. You haven't. It so happens that you do that in that sense. Now, look, for us, I don't think in any context it's it's to to use that uh, uh, word. Just the other day, I'm playing a video by uh, Fat Joe, and I was uncomfortable because he kept. I'm like, well, it, you know, it is what I listen today. I'm working out with E in the morning. Mm-hmm. Six o'clock in the morning. You know what I'm listening to the workout? Who do you think I'm listening to when I'm working out today? I'm listening to Troublesome. I'm listening to Life Goes On. I'm listening to, you know, uh, uh, All I Need in This Life is Sin is me and my, you know. I'm, I'm listening to Hit Em Up this morning. I'm working out. And I'm sitting with up. Jimbo and we're working out right now. Some people say, Pat, you, you lost your mind. Gets me going at the gym. Now, so sometimes we're around it, but... Uh, uh, I'm glad you were uh, open to talking about that. Appreciate you for doing that, being a good sport about it. Because, again, in business nowadays, what I hear a lot when we're doing consulting with different folks, this is starting to become more of an issue today than before. So it's constantly coming up. Yeah, the, the, the two things that I'm most thankful for going through this, for some reason, the public knew this was dirty pool. They knew this had a stint. They never bought into this whole that they, the whole story. They didn't buy into the John. And I, I mean, usually the public is kind of gullible. And the second thing is, I, I have a tape. <laughs> they left the tape. The dumbasses left the tape fronted. And I have the tape that says, you know, we, you know, we basically hope he gets sent out to pasture. We hope this guy gets screwed because we're part of it. So, I'm. A, we got him by the throat. They set me up. They mischaracterized what I said. Um, they reversed the intent of what I said, and the public never bought it in the first place. Hmm. So how lucky am I? Well, it's based on that, I think that's the best transition to see. Let's see how their pizza is doing. So, Eric, if you want to bring everybody in here real quick, we are going to do a social experiment right now, a social experiment that we just thought about last minute. Uh, uh, if you guys want to head in here and, and don't break the bank's vault door, Okay, so what? Oh, Neil. Ooh, Neil has entered the building. So everybody, come over here. Come around. Come around. Come around. Oh, Natalia, God. come on, Natalia. Who we got? Rob as well in his Hello, suit everybody. today. So nice to meet so, you. How you doing? What's oh, your name, sir? I recognize sir? this girl. I recognize this girl right how here. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Okay, Natalia. So here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do, Rob. I asked you to get numbers to four local pizza joints. Okay. Right? We said four of them. Yep, we have four. So each of you is going to call one of them simultaneously. You're going to step out, and you're gonna, we're going to time it. I'm going to give you the time on when you called it. Okay. Okay? You're going to get the number ready to call, and you're going to tell us who you're calling. You're going to order a regular pizza, okay. a, a pepperoni pizza, and the works, right? Is that what we agreed on? John, those are the two we're doing. Yeah, we'll do peps and the works. Okay, peps and the works. Okay, that's what you're doing. And then we're going to wait to see how long it takes to come. We'll time it, Eric. As they come in here to the front door, somebody's just got to time it. 32 minutes, 28 minutes, 26 minutes, 59 minutes, whatever the time is going to be. Well, hopefully the podcast then will still we'll be going it up on here, here. And we'll judge this pizza by somebody who's been in this space for quite a while. So he kind of knows the pizza game well. So the moment we say three, two, one. First of all, who are you calling? Natalia, who's yours? I'm calling Pizza Hut. Okay, so you're calling Pizza Hut. Papa John's. Papa John's. Dominoes. Dominoes. Jets. Jets. Get your phones ready, everybody, on 321. I'll let you know to dial. 321. Dial. 323. You guys can step out. You guys can step out. You guys can step out and go place your orders. And don't mention a guy we know uh, named Papa John. Okay? (laughs) (laughs) All right. 323 it is. Hey, Neil, good to see you, buddy. You as well. 323 it is to see how long this is going to take. What would you say? Are they already calling? Yes? Okay, sounds good. All right, so let's get back into this here today. Um, do you still eat pizza? I eat pizza, yeah. Do you? Do you make when, it yourself, or is it? Do you order it? Do you? <laughs> I've got a pizza oven at home. Okay. The, key, the key to the the pizza is really the oven and the dough. And so I'll I'll get some dough from Papa John's or get some dough from my friends at Jets Pizza. And then once you got the dough right and the oven right, you can kind of you can kind of wink it from there. Now, which but, dough is more important, dough as in bread or dough as in money? Which which dough would you? Because you got both of them, so. <laughs> well, well, this, guy, <laughs> this guy made the dough by making the dough. dough. So, yeah, um, no, he go. was uh, thinking uh, about it. Uh, well, without the first dough, I wouldn't have the second dough. Right. So probably the first dough, the pizza dough, dough right? Uh, I think money talks and BS walks. I think you got to go with the cash. You got to go with the cash is what you got to go yeah, with. Yeah. <clears throat> so today with uh, uh, everything that's going on, you were talking about a lot of different things with in regards to pizza. Uh, it, I got a couple guys that I know that run pizza shops. Is this a time where a small business owner, kind of like yourself that came out, 
And you go, you were telling the Ray Kroc story as the founder, how he went from not being the first Burger King was there already. You know, all the other guys were, is this a good time to open up a pizza business? You know, I started in Reaganomics in 1984 when I founded Papa John's. You know, we had a leader that was small regulation, uh, pro business, uh, pro small business. Um, you know, what was this saying? The most dangerous words in the English language are, um, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah. Uh, small, you know, smaller taxes. I grew up with that. And I mean, how lucky was I? Um, you know, we're this this situation, this administration is just anti-small business. And um, I I don't like what when you 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 can have empathy for um, folks when you've walked a mile in their shoe. When, I mean, you know, I told you we cut grass when I was eight, mm-hmm. painted gutters when I was twelve. Um, did the bar when I was 21, started Papa John's when I was 20. I mean, uh, even when we got big, we were a family of small businesses. You know, the average franchisee had, what, three or four stores. So my love and affection and appreciation and respect for small business is probably second to none. I mean, if I was going to be like, let's take a Papa John franchisee. You know, you're, you're getting involved with a company that's let the quality slip, let the service slip, uh, unit economics um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not sure 30, 40, 50 percent of the stores out there are not making money or breaking even. Um, you had this issue with the founder that you got a board that hired a CEO, hired an agency that caused a huge mess and, and really tainted the brand. Is that team still there that got rid of you? No, the CEO that, that did this got uh, got fired um, probably 10 months after I left. They fired the CEO that did this. Um but by that time, they were already in default of their loans. It didn't take long to crater Papa John's when I left. I mean, we this went down July of 18, and by November of 18, they were already in default of their loans and their loan uh, covenants. It went down quick after I left, and then COVID saved them for a couple of years, and now the stock's less today than it was when I was there in 16. But my biggest concern for a potential Papa John franchisee and the franchisees who are there now who I know and love is this IRS thing. Um, you know, you saw last night when Mike Landell was rated with I the FBI, yeah. FBI, Trump yeah. just got rated. I mean, we now have Nazi Germany where if you're a conservative and you believe in conservative principles and you're outspoken, you got the KGB. Um, you believe that? <laughs> the AG, the FBI, uh, the, you know, the internal... Um, Revenue service now. I mean, yeah, the the government is now an enemy of the the freedoms of the people. And if you don't think that you know, if they attack Lindell, Trump, Flynn, Papa John, if they attack us, sooner or later they're going to attack every American that doesn't believe in their ideology that has a voice. And you came from Iran. I've talked to people from Hungary, um, Lebanon. Uh, Pakistan. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, you all know exactly what we're dealing with. Cuba, yeah. Venezuela. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you all know that th- this is not fun stuff. What they're when when the state controls the media, and the state controls the government agencies that can um, perpetrate and um, uh, hurt the people that are supposed to be protecting our freedoms. You're dealing with a very dangerous situation here. And by the way, they're not. They don't hide what they do. They're very open because they want to intimidate you so folks like the three of us don't talk about what they're doing. But this is a very dangerous situation when the state controls the media and controls the agencies which are going after our freedoms, our individual freedoms, our freedom of speech, et cetera. Do you think uh, uh, this strategy they're taking is sustainable long term or do you think eventually it's going to come to a stop? Or do you think people have to stand up today or else – it could end up being something that stays for a while. If it continues, then we are down the path where we reward people that don't work with monies from people that do work. That's socialism. I mean, show me anywhere in the history of man where socialism hasn't decreased the quality of life for its uh, citizens. So this is, yeah, this is going to get, it's going to have to get, I mean, this midterm uh, is crucial to stopping the, the, you know, the kind of the KGB, uh, Nazi, Gasapo kind of um, mindset and ideology has been promoted by the upper left right now. I think this is critical. Do you think they're going to, last night we're having dinner 
at a restaurant I've never been before called Casa de Angelo. Yeah, good okay, place. Which I go there three or four times a week. I was at Angelo today. And we're sitting down having a good dinner with a few of our friends. And one of the questions comes up at the end, after two and a half hours of dinner. Do you think he's going to get indicted? Do you think that's going to happen? Uh, if you watch some uh, outlets, left, right, center, some are saying yes. Uh, all of left is saying yes. Some of right are start, starting to say yes. Uh, question number one, do you think he'll get indicted? Number two, if he does, what will happen? Who are you talking about, Trump? Trump, yeah. Okay. If you're Trump and you weren't prepared for this and you didn't set a booby trap, then you deserve what you're going to get because you know he had to know that they were going to come after him. And if you don't think that way, if I'm not thinking that way, I'm thinking that way. Five moves ahead. Landell was thinking that way. You're in our shoes. you got to be knowing what they're going to do. Steve Bannon's been out saying they're going to raid Mar-a-Lago now for six months, 12 months. So what Trump should have had was a picture of Biden's. I mean, he, there should have been something in there where – it made them all look like fools. But, you know, if he had classified documents that really are unclassified because he, he has the right to do that, he's got to know that even though he unclassified them, they say top secret, perception-wise, they're going to kill him. But he has to know that. He's a smart guy. He's the smart of all, uh, the three of us put together. So if he got sloppy... And, and he wasn't the one that put it all, you know, put it all over the office floor. He didn't do that. That was that was a setup by the uh, the FBI. But if he did not prepare for them to do what they did, not knowing that they're going to twist it. Remember, I said Colonel Sanders says it. I would never say it. Lost my company. You, they will twist the slightest little thing and destroy you. He's got to know that. And if he left himself wide open, he's going to pay the price. So, so your answer is it could he could post possibly be indicted. <clears throat> okay, remember the COVID vaccines? Uh, before then, they had um, I'm not going to chlory hydroxychloroquine, and then help me with other ivermectin. Ivermectin. Okay, the one there that's really the one that does it, ivermectin. But both hydroxychloroquine and both the ivermectin. Ivermectin. The ivermectin will keep you from getting sick. Um, he put hydroxychloroquine out there because he knew it would work and he knew the left would shoot it down because he promoted it. He did that intentionally to leave the other drug where you get access to it. He's a smart guy. I mean, he's a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. I can't believe that he would leave himself that wide open, especially with lawyers. What's your uh, split? Is it 50-50, 80-20? On that he's indicted? Yeah. We, the market crashed yesterday. That just changed the whole election, what, 54 days out. So it, it depends on what day it is. I, I think I, I think that the left will do anything to get the focus, the American public's attention off fuel prices, devaluating the dollar, inflation, uh, the war, the uh, botched defunding of the police, anything to get the public off the real issues – and on to Trump or something else, I think that the media will do it. Because the media is simply a le an arm uh, for the left. So, I mean, if it'll sell newspapers and draw attention from the real issues, I think the left will go that far with this. So you're, you're more of a, it's more likely to happen than not to happen. That's kind of what you're saying. That's no. how I took it. Well, no. Kai, I'm sending you a few pictures. Prepare those, please. <clears throat> I think the odds of Trump not being prepared for this are very low. So you're saying he's ready for it if they do indict him? If he wasn't prepared for this, then shame on him. He's now had four years to know that he's dealing with the devil, and the devil plays dirty on every corner. And if he he's a proactive guy, just the, so I think he is ready. Now, whether uh, this AG files uh, indicts him or not, that's 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 just simply you know the the craziness of the left because you know I don't think even if he didn't do anything wrong which again he can declassify whatever he says he can declassify if they find a technicality well you declassify but you didn't follow, follow the right process then he's done I guess we're gonna find out here soon what happens there by the way you were an operator from eighty four to say eighteen uh, uh, thirty four years of running a business from zero to a multi multi billion auto company right three and a half billion auto company. 
uh, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty intense to do something like that. Very few people in America have done that. But the question becomes, are you, how closely are you following the markers? Because for you, the pizza business, you have to follow market closely because your customer is low and middle income families and sports fans. So everything matters to you. Like when 9-11 happens, probably you can track back to what happened to your business, whether it was good or not. Or when... You know, 2008 happened, 2007 when the market tanked 38%, you, you have to see, well, well, that was a good year for us because people went from buying high-end food to they realized they can afford only buy pizza, so we did well, or this did well. When you look at the different markers today, okay, well, what we have, amount of money we printed, we're seeing inflation, we're seeing, you know, gas prices, we're seeing what happened to the stock market yesterday, we're seeing loan officers refinancing business out, mortgage rates are up now, you know, 6%, 5.9%, if you got a 650 credit score, all this stuff that's happening, there's, and then you hear the camp, we're not in recession, we know the definition of recession, we know all this stuff. Have we hit bottom yet? It's at 31,000 right now. If you look at Dow today, it's at 31,000, give or take, right? It went up a little bit, but not a lot of it, but it's around 31,000 Dow. How low do you think it'll go? It's at 30,952 is where it closed. It ended up being down 152. Are we at the bottom? Or do you think with the things that's going on, we're still got some more room to go lower than 30,950 today? Well, I can tell you one of three things. The market will go up. It'll stay the same. It'll go down. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Who knows? Um Market December when Trump was still in office of 19, the market was 20, 29, 30,000. So we're within 4% of what it was when Trump was in office. Um, the, I, I invest to where if the market goes to 40, I do real well. I hit all, if the market stays at 35, I still give my dividend income and I'm fine with that. And if the market crashes, I've got a fund called the Black Swan Universa. It's a Black Swan event. Last time the market went from 29.7 down to 20, that was up 4,000 times, 4,000%. So it's a real hedge fund. So I'm in a position where whatever happens, um, I love, it's called Almore Fatih, A-R-M-O-R Fatih, F-I-T-I, Almore Fatih, love thy fate. So no matter what happens, I love my fate. Now, the I think the market is sketchy to go down. But remember, black swan events are not predictable, i.e. they're printing money. we got a war in Taiwan, potentially a war in Ukraine. Black swan events are <clears throat> a dice, though. You can pick a dice with six sides. Uh, you can pick a dice with 120 sides. Um, 120 sides is about all you can get before it becomes a marble and it really doesn't ever stop. Interesting. So <clears throat> what the bet is, here's the bet, gentlemen. Here's your black swan, here's your universa. I'm going to bet you that those 120 dice, because what goes on in the world is probably one in 120, but mm -hmm. we're kind of getting the mathematics. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bet you it pops up one on all three dices, and I'm going to pay you 30 cents a day to bet you that does on my $10,000 investment. And, it, and that takes about 10 years to go through that 30 cents or whatever it is. <clears throat> now, believe it or not, sooner or later, all those three dice are going to show up all once. That's a black swan. Don't know when has nothing to do with Mark. So what I do is we've already had a 36.7 Dow that's down to 31. So that's 5,700. What's that, 70 percent, 16 to 18 percent? Okay, a lot of folks have taken a haircut. I think the NASDAQ's down 30. So this is a good place to where at least you've avoided the first 20 or 30 percent. Mm -hmm. um, I think now I'm this is the I never pay attention to markets unless they go way up or they go way down. Mm -hmm. This morning before I came over here, I'm watching the markets because we're playing, I call it my blackjack money, you know, where I, I actually, I don't really, it's not enough money to watch a shotgun for the net worth, <laughs> but it makes me feel like I'm doing something. Okay. <clears throat> and so, we're we're buying what we do is we buy on the way down so the old time entry point was thirty five thousand dow we feel to your point things are shakier now our entry points more like thirty two thirty three thousand the farther it goes down the more i load up so it averages so one or two oh, things like, yeah, yeah is that you know so say you put in two million at thirty three thousand dow at a twenty eight thousand dow you may put in twenty million 
you're going to pull that gotcha. average down. Now, if it runs back up, okay, your dividend stocks go up because they go up in the market. You got your dividends, and you make money on your blackjack. If it crashes, you kick it in the teeth with your black swan. The only, thing, the only way to lose is if you have a death of a thousand small cuts where it goes what it's done now, 36, 35, 34, 32, 31, 30, 29. It does. We, need, we need a 10% either kick in the teeth or we need this to get back up to 40,000. I, um, I think there's so much going on that's unknown, that's very dangerous, that the market should be sketchy, but that makes rational sense. Markets are never rational. It's an emotional game. And so you just got to know that. Um, it's an emotional game. So I don't think I answered one bit of your question. <laughs> well, you should run for office because that was like you you simply gave, uh, uh, you know, uh, answers on dollar cost average and a few different things, but nothing was ever answered. You know, it wasn't <laughs> answered. By the way, poetic. just out of curiosity, when you're looking at this, this story came out. I, I'm curious to know how you're going to speculate this. A record 19 million Americans asked the IRS for tax extensions. Nearly one in eight American asked the IRS for more time to file. Here's what you need to know uh, about the October 17 deadline. Do, do, when you read this, why do you think record-breaking 19 million Americans asked the IRS for tax extensions? Is that a consistent uh, number through time, or is that a once? No, this is, this is the highest ever record, 19 million. We've never had 19 million Americans ask to extend their taxes with the IRS. Well, you know, just shooting from the hip, I'd say that folks are thinking they're getting ready to get audited and then they're checking, uh, you know, they're, um, you know, measuring three times, going to cut once to make sure what they turn in is accurate. And I think they're asking for an extension, so their accuracy of their tax return is something they, they can't come back on. That's how I read it. How do you read it? I, I actually wonder, like, why are people asking for tax extensions? Is it because they overextended themselves and they don't have the money to pay what they're thinking they're gonna owe? Is it because they overspend? Is it because it's, it's pretty strange to have this kind of a number at a season like this? Well, I'll give you a number that's kind of scary is that the normal GDP of the government to our GDP is about 15, 16%. Mm -hmm. Last two years under COVID, it's been more like 30. So it's double. So this, we got a little taste of socialism. Socialism is when your DDP gets above 25, 30%. That's when people get entitlements and they get a free lunch and they stop working. So what the article was saying was a, a variety of factors is to blame beyond just procrastination. Uh, taxpayers say shifting due, uh, due dates, COVID-related tax law changes, late forms, the IRS backlog, and taxpayer burnout. Yeah, I, I actually think this is a byproduct of uh, of all that i I'm, I'm one of these 19 million americans and this is basically why if you re recall april of 20 they pushed back the tax deadline to i don't remember when it was and then so everything got pushed back pushed back pushed back so that if your 20 got pushed back your 21 will get pushed back so that's essentially what's happening right now is like all right i'll just deal with it later there's no uh, there's no urgency to get that done, and they kept pushing it back. Just like student loan payments, it's the exact same thing. Forbearance, forbearance, they'll keep pushing it back. Um, you know this in any type of sale. There's two things that create a sale. It's urgency and scarcity. If you don't have to do it, or if it's not running out, uh, you don't you won't, just won't do it. So I just don't think there's been any sense of urgency or scarcity. Um, to get this done. That's just my two cents. Yeah, but I mean, I, every year is the same when it comes down to that. The only no, no, thing no, no, is... No, no, no. Yes, but not since COVID because they kept pushing back the deadlines. Got it. If you're saying, hey, the homework's due uh, on Friday. Well, it's actually due next month. It's fine. All right, God. When are you going to do your homework? You're not right. going to do it this Friday. Right. All right, actually, by the way, we're going to actually... You have till the end of the year to do your homework. Yes. You're never going to do your homework. He used the that word. Day. He didn't use the word fickle, but it was a word like fickle. There's a lot of things going on in the market right now where it's tough to kind of predict what's going to be happening. Here's another one from Yahoo Money yesterday. Inflation, grocery prices in August rose 13 and a half percent, the highest increase since March of '79. That's not a small number, by the way. 13 and a half percent. You know, that means if you spend, I don't know, $1,000 a month on grocery for your family, you got, you got a family of five, four, husband, wife, two kids. Now you're doing $1,350. That's $113. $113 of after tax money is like $200 of pre tax money. Did people get a $200 raise? Did people get a 13.5% raise? 
I don't know. So so too many of these figures adding up, you know, it's it's making you kind of a and by the way, did you see the other article about real estate property around the world? How it's just dipping? Did you see the chart that they had? Mm. Uh, I sent it to you on Instagram if you pull it up. Um it's not that one, it's the other one. If you go on Instagram, you'll see it. Uh, yeah, that's that's the one. You can zoom in on that one. Go ahead and zoom in on that one. You can zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Look at that right there. Go a little lower. Bloomberg, go a little lower. The other way, the other way, the other way. Yeah, so there you go. So the world's hottest housing markets are facing a painful reset. Okay, Toronto's going up. That's not really taking a hit. It's shown from 2020 how much it's gone up. Look at the number, by the way. Toronto's gone up 45% just in two years. 45%. Stockholm went up 35%, and then it's dropped down to 20%. Auckland went up. 45% 45% and it's dropped to 20%. So it's dropped another 25% in the last six months or 10 months. And Sydney went up 25% and it's now only up 15%. So a, a, a lot of people right now, do you have any opinions on the, on the real estate market? Are you kind of, you know, you have any ideas of what you think is going to happen with all the inventory, the rates going up, how it's going to affect it? Well, you know, back to the previous slide on the groceries, I mean, you just got to look what people are doing and credit cards are blooming. You know, they're maxed out right now. Savings accounts are plummeting. Mm -hmm. People are borrowing money to go to groceries. So that's a pretty good uh, indicator that the party's over, you know, get out of the pool, we're getting ready to wake up to reality. Um, My biggest concern through all this is, is inflation. Yes. But deflation of real estate, when you got houses that you're paying 254 and you've only had 250,000 and you had to put 20 grand down and then all of a sudden that house is worth 180 and people just leave us with the keys. The, the deflation thing could happen with housing, and that, that would be back to a Euro 708 bust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you think that's... It's possible. Okay. So if that does happen, you know, 31 is not going to be the lowest for Dow. You could be... You think we'll touch 25? The interview I gave 14 months ago, 30 yeah. months ago, I was going to hey... You know, the, the, the game changer here is if they raise interest rates. The guy kind of looked at me like I was crazy. I said, start raising interest rates from, you know, oh, yeah. zero or one or whatever it was. Now, now what's a six year, 6% on a 30 year mortgage? They keep that up. Yeah, 31 could be a nice number on the Dow. Mm-hmm. 31 could be a nice, a nice number, number on the Dow. If they yeah. keep raising interest yeah. rates. I want to ask you a question since we're going in this deep finance rabbit hole. I want to ask you a question on asset allocation. Um, you're a billionaire worth a billion dollars, respect. Um, Without getting in the nitty gritty, what percentage are you cash, stock, real estate, crypto, other type of investments? Uh, Would you be willing to kind of give us the asset allocation balance? I think the key with asset allocation is what makes you comfortable? You know, we'll just start with, let's take $100,000. Some people made one hundred thousand cash. I've literally had people that are buying bonds. I'm like, bonds, really? <laughs> been buying bonds for years. Yeah, I forgot like, to even gonna, ask you yeah, about yeah. bonds, right? Um, you know, um, some people have thirty percent, forty percent in precious metals. I'm like, you know, if they blow it up, gold's not going to double or triple. It's going to quadruple. You don't need thirty percent of your portfolio. But I think it depends on, um, you know, the person's I, what makes them comfortable. Really, I mean. Some people are, are worth $10 million and they live in a $500,000 house. Some people are worth $10 million and they live in a $20 million house. That's what makes them comfortable. But the one thing I've learned, I have three kids, and you know when you talk about the kind of wealth we're talking about, it distorts reality. It really does. And it can mess their head up, and it has that, and uh, like for all of us. The one thing I've learned – with kids is dividend stocks teach them how much a million dollars is. So if if the child does have a million dollars in its trust, that's fifty grand a year. They need to understand that's what a million, a million dollars. It's fifty thousand bucks a year. That's what it is. It's no more, no less. And that's the one thing that I've been able to do. That whether they start off with a hundred grand or twenty grand, you know, twenty grand a year, twenty thousand in the bank is, is a thousand bucks a year. That's what it is. You know, you know, if you get up to two million, that's a hundred thousand a year. So it does teach the kids the value. That's the one thing. It's the only thing mechanism I've because they go, well, what's five million? What's you know they think like that. And it's like mm-hmm. <laughs> five million. <laughs> don't even you know, 
Uh, I haven't given hundred mil. I haven't given any of the kids any anything close to five million dollars or even three million dollars. I got one daughter that's thirty eight. Another one's thirty six. My son's twenty four. Until they show me they can manage the money, and you feel bad because you want somebody to come along that kind of respects what you've done. Uh, or at least appreciates it, or at least is going to guard it. But I was watching the Vanderbilts, um, Cornelius Vanderbilt. He had uh, 10, 10 kids and left 95% of it, I think, to William. None of the other uh, nine kids could handle the wealth. And he you know, told William, keep the wealth. To, well, so, you know, even out of 10 kids, he only had one that could handle. Mm-hmm. At the time, this was 80, 1787, he had 100, billion, 100 million, which was, by the way, 124th of the GDP. I mean, the the, the GDP in eight. 1887 was like 2.8 billion, and he had 100 million of it. One, so one out of one out of every 28 dollars was his in the America. Translated Incredible. in today's money, oh. the, the GDP today is what? Uh, 124 trillion. So let's let's just say a, a trillion. It's a trillion. He's a trillionaire. He's worth more than all the five other guys are. Vanderbilt. Yeah. Damn. But and he, they, he did ships and 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 uh, trains. He was. He was a bad, bad, you said, uh, was a bad guy. Your kids are 38, 36, 24? 24. You started young. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do your kids do now? My youngest likes computers. He likes gaming. The 24-year-old. Yeah, he loves the gaming. You know, the, the, Did he go to college? Went to college, didn't finish college. He doesn't okay. like college, doesn't like books. Uh, Danielle. So now he's a, just, he, does he have a job? Yeah. He works for Panda up in uh, Detroit. Okay. Yeah. Gaming. Doing gaming. He likes gaming. That's good. Likes the contest. So that's likes the games. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My um, middle jo- daughter is an entrepreneur. She likes uh, urban products out of uh, Utah. And then my oldest daughter is an attorney, criminal attorney, <clears throat> and a hard worker. Loves criminal law. Loves getting people out of binds when they've done bad things. And and self sustained. They all work. They don't. Yeah, like, they, they, they all work. Okay. But but um, they don't know how to manage. Sure, don't know how to manage five million dollars, much less five hundred million dollars. Yet, it's it's early. You you believe in the whole concept that if you pass away, you give all of them a you know a third or third or third, you leave it to them, or you believe more in the you know some J. Paul Getty. He he was died very rich, but he only left his five kids a million a pop. I think that's the number. What's your philosophy on that? I'm somewhere between a third, a third, a third, and zero, zero, zero. <laughs> I want to see some. You I don't want to give it away. I want to see some demonstration that they respect and can handle the wealth. Are going to yeah. do good deeds yeah. with it. Otherwise, I'll find somebody else to give it to. I what mean, would I, you like? It, let's say your kids don't get any. Gosh. Hypothetical. Where where would the money go? There's so many books out there that will tell you that all these trusts are scams. I mean, these universities. I mean. You can leave it to a university. I mean, they're really <laughs> all the universities are run by the left. But um, I'd probably lean towards a private park, and then I'd endow it to where they, you know, they keep the park up um, and um, just tie it up so tight that they can't rip off the trust for it. Mm-hmm. Papa John's Park and kids get free pizza every we've, Friday, like yeah. back in uh, elementary yeah. school. Let's we've, go. We've built two parks. We built Ford's Ford's Fork out of uh, Louisville, and we got a, a park in Anchorage. And that's probably, the, out of all the things I've done, that's the funnest of the parks I've built. Yeah. By the way, a quick update, just so you guys know. It was 3.23 when they called. It's 3.53. It's been 30 minutes. No one's here yet. No What's about there. the timeline of on one day deliver? Is it? Um, you want to get there in 30 minutes. Okay. Do so none there. of them have hit it yet. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Okay, let's if take, you were okay, still CEO okay. of Papa John's, we'd have that pizza by now. Pat would be soaked in garlic that. sauce at this here, point. Here, now, okay, let's take a camera, hidden camera, <laughs> sure, and we sure. do the family in the living room, and they order pizza. Okay. 30 minutes, somebody asks, where's the pizza? Yeah. 30 minutes, every single time. Mm-hmm. 40, 41 minutes, they ask again. At 44 minutes, people start to get pissed off. At 54 minutes, what do you think they do at 54 minutes? They're calling the store. That they round it up to an hour. It's been an hour. Not really an hour. It's 54 minutes. Right. But they round it up to an hour. Oh, hell yeah. So we're now, getting hungry. We're now between a little bit of agitation to moving the barometer over to super pissed off. So let's see how they do. I love how you know the metrics and and just the... the it's his business. Of course. <laughs> well, I mean, can, can you give a little insight? When, when you He walked in, and by the way, thank you. You brought some pizza for the production team. They were they were very appreciative. He brought the pizza? Yeah, I believe we, so. We ordered the pizza. Yeah. Uh, by the way, yeah. you know what is cool? Just so you know, for the folks at Papa John's, if you're pissed off, he brought Papa John's pizza and yeah. he brought... 
Jet's Jet pizza. pizza. So it's not like he didn't no. bring. Even though he's calling you out, he still brought a bunch he of Papa did. John's but pizza. But what he did out there was super impressive. I'll give you the mic right now. But he master went class. in, oh, no, yeah, opened yeah. the box. Everyone at the at, at Valuetainment got a master class in pizza one on one. You see here, right here, cross the inside this way. All right, the sauce. All right, but give us a little like your mindset when you saw this pizza. Well, I've been consulting Jeff's now for three years, and Jeff's Pizza never left their quality, and they never left their mission. You know, they stuck to their knitting and their, and their people and their quality. Papa John's, I've been on their case now for three years that, hey, you better stop playing games with your food quality and your service. You better make it the way the pizza was designed to make it. You're going to get yourself in trouble. And both things have come to fruition. But I wanted to see Papa John's next to Jet's because it really is reality. They didn't know who was ordering it. And two is if you watch the people. Yeah. When you don't make that. Papa John's is a really good pizza, if you make it right. Yeah. But if you don't have the right ingredients, you start slipping on those ingredients, yeah. and you don't put it together right, it's a mediocre product. I'll bet you go out there, the Jets pizza is probably eaten, and they probably haven't eaten the Papa John's. I didn't want to offend you, man. I saw the pizza popped. I didn't realize mm -hmm. how you were at. I saw the Jets pizza and the Papa John's. <laughs> I took a slice of the Jets. Of course you did. It was crusty. So has the name oh. changed? Who's oh. first? Who's, Who's first? first? Pizza, pizza Hut was first. Okay, Pizza Hut's first place. How long did what's it take? What's the time? Yeah, what's the time? Three fifty-eight. Three? No, it's not, you can't say three fifty-eight. It's fifty-six. Three fifty-five. So they got here in twenty-two minutes. Okay, set it up right in front of him because he's the expert here. Huh, I we're, thought we were going to do like a blind taste test thing. Gonna, no, we're not going to do that. Okay, so we got Pizza Hut there. Nobody else is here yet, Natalia. Okay, all right, sounds Natalia, good. Natalia, I vote for you to be the pizza gal. You keep coming in and parade the pizza. It's our Vanna White over here of pizza. Okay, so we got Pizza Hut took 32 minutes uh, is what it took. So, By the way, is it fair to say that Papa John's should change the name to Decent Ingredient, Decent Pizza, <laughs> Papa John's? Instead of better ingredient, better pizza, Papa By John's. the way, how did you come up with the name Papa John? You were, you were a kid at the time. Okay, I'm, um, I got the recipes. Worked at Rockies, worked at Greeks, had the equipment, and got all of this in my brain on what's going to make a pizzeria. Yeah. Didn't have a name. I'm in La Folla dorm, 1982. There's a dorm made, uh, made of mine, marketing major from Chicago. I said, I got everything, but I don't have a name. He comes back three days later with the logo and the name Papa John's. Straight that up. That was it. Dorm mate. From La Folla Gym, 1982, Ball the, State. So you never picked it. You didn't pick. You didn't. Come I didn't pick the name. It was it. He picked the name. That was a buddy you lived with in the door. <laughs> and I said, if ever goes, I thanks, said, homie. I said, if ever goes big, I'll give you a pizza a week for the rest of your life. He's never come forward. He's never. Come you don't forward. even know who he is. Now, if I was back in Papa John's, I would put out a ten million dollar reward. Maybe not ten million. Let's do. It. Five hundred thousand, whatever. Yeah. I mean, what something reward? No, no, no. Ten million. I like that. that. Yeah. We're gonna find this guy. We're Ten million. That sounds guy. good to me. <laughs> Who came up so with the name he, Papa John's? It was. You don't even remember his name. No, he, he was a friend. He was a doormate. But you don't remember his name. You don't remember like your, your roommate's name that had the friend. No, he did. A Adam. He didn't like school. He just said it. So that's true. He was busy. Like there you his, go, Eric. Like his twenty-four-year-old son. I relate to that son. Okay, so Pizza Hut's first. Is, is, are you surprised that Pizza Hut's first or no? I mean, it's hit and miss in different markets. Can we get some my, plates? My concern with um, the big players, Papa John's, Domino's, and uh, Little Caesars, is the when you really don't put it together right and you have the right ingredients, all you've done is create a commodity. And when you're a commodity, then you're chasing the rat hole down the drain of price. And that's what you've got. So right now, you know, Papa John's scores are at parity with Little Caesars on the ACSI award. Papa John's scores are like 75, 74 the last two years. Little Caesar scores are like 70. So Papa John's is that parity. So you're going to say better ingredient, better pizza, turn around and sell a product that we saw out front, and then the consumer perceives you as a Little Caesar's quality. They're in a bad – it's a death spiral. It's a black cloud. They better get it. They better get their acting and they get back to the the product that made that brand great. But Little Caesars, I feel, is by far and away the cheapest. They have the full five dollars hot and ready. They are playing for, in a market like untouched. How's that look, by the it way? Looks good. This is this is actually remember the two things you got to have ingredients in every bite. Yeah. Ingredients out to the edge. Now you've got an inch, pretty well around that most of it. That's a no no, but. It, we and that Papa John pizza we saw earlier was, you know, two, three, four inches. And mm -hmm. the Jets, it was right to the edge. So oh, let's, yeah. let's see how the other guys do. But I, um, that's the pepperoni. Yeah, this is a this is a, a frozen crust. This isn't a homemade crust, but this is Loprino cheese, which it's 
cheap. It's about as cheap as you can get. Uh, pepperonis look okay, but I mean, it, I mean, <clears throat> it's pizza. Why would you order that over frozen pizza? I mean, there's nothing about that that's spectacular. Why really. would you order that Pizza Hut over frozen pizza? Why, why would you look at that? I mean, tell me why that's better than a frozen pizza. Do you want to take a bite? Oh, we're going to take a bite. We got now. We got who we got next? Who's next? Papa's oh, Papa we're Papa John. <laughs> All right, Papa John. All right, big Papa John. So, Papa John, what, what was the time? What time did he get here? Just two seconds ago. Two seconds ago, so 4.23, 37 minutes. But well, we did have an issue that um, they didn't deliver in this area. Hold on, Natalia. We had to call another one. Oh. There so was there an w- issue that they didn't deliver to this area, so we had to call another one. God. So that took another two or three minutes. I got okay. you. Okay. All right. Cool. So we got Papa John's. How does that look to you these, when you see these, that? These are better than the ones we ordered right off the bat. Um, but here's the here's Eric. You want to grab the mic so you can zoom in because, yeah. folks, if, if you're watching this right now, let me tell you, yeah. this place smells like pizza and it smells yeah. incredible. Believe me, Eric wants to grab more <clears throat> oh than the God. mic. He wants one of these uh, slices and a little side of paella. So what? What if you look at the Papa John's versus the pizza? You can't really tell the difference. Um, if they were uh, right, if they weren't right next to each other, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And the, the Papa John's has got a couple sins. First of all, you got the, the coppings falling over the heads. So the reason we created the uh, crust, we, we call it edge stretching, is so the crust would be able to dip it in the bar- garlic sauce. You've pretty well lost that um, luxury when you've covered it up. It does have plenty of pepperonis on it. It looks like it's got uh, plenty of cheese. Uh, you got an inconsistent bake. But, uh, again, the, the thing that makes Papa John's Papa John's is the crust. And we've gone from a hand-tossed dough to where they now do it with a machine. So they actually put in a, you know, like a padding place it down. Mm-hmm. And so you lose that authentic, really, where the dough kind of rises. But this is this still wouldn't be an eight pizza. This would be probably a seven pizza. maybe Seven, seven. out of ten, you're saying. Seven out of ten. If it's not an eight, you're not supposed to serve it. Um, this product would be... It wouldn't be an eight either, but at least it's got toppings on it. But again, you know, see, there's not toppings out to the edge. But if I'd have been CEO and these would have come, this would have been a huge disappointment. These would have been sub seven pizzas. Uh, today, they're probably what I've seen in Papa John's the last, you know, 16 months. These are actually some of the better ones I've seen. But again, they're not, you're not going to be able to differentiate mm. between a Pizza Hut and a Papa John's. But let's see what the other two players come in. What at. about the, uh, the Works uh, Pizza Hut one down over there? By the way, you're not going to stop Pat from having some of that garlic sauce right there. I already know where Pat's at. I'm preparing like my eyes on the garlic. Are there onions on this pizza? Are there onions on the... Pat, we're going to have an issue with this. For John. For John. But by the way, so you look at that and you look at this. Now, some people like thin crust, but what do you think about the way the Pizza Hut one looks? I I think this is... I think the Papa John's in this case is demonstrably better. Um the cheese is more moist because you got more toppings. This pizza doesn't have much on it, considering it's supposed to be a works. Lodi? That is a and, works, um, yeah. When you don't put as much on, it dries out. So whereas these two, these two pizzas are pretty well at parity, I'd say Papa John's is going to be a little bit better than the pizza because it's got slightly more cheese on it. Um, and they're prepared about uh, the same level. Uh, I'd say the uh, pizza pizza is not nearly as good as the, the Papa John work pizza in this case. So Papa John beats pizza here on, the, on this particular uh, case. That one one case one survey doesn't make a study, you know. But but, I mean, but the fact that you're being straight up though, listen. So so pizza against Papa John's on the works. Papa John's is winning so yeah. far. But remember, this is this is the worst pizza. It's about the worst standard you can have. Pizza Hut is, is the worst they, standard. They, they, the, the, the one of the best brands it was, but now their their product quality has gone down. Actually, more than Papa John's has gone down. So this this wow. is a horse race to the bottom. It's a horse race to the bottom. bottom between wow. these two players. And what's their race. incentive for going down to the bottom? To cut costs, to Cost. cut labor, cut what? Stock Save options. more money. Stock options. Stock options. I mean, bureaucrats. Uh, all all's the CEO, Rob Lynch, and this board care about is the share price. What they don't understand is you keep doing this, and you're going to be up, uh, you're going to be at ten dollars a share. <laughs> they cannot keep Papa John's cannot keep doing this, and and expect to be at. I think it's. I think eighty-five bucks a share should be. Free. I'd short it. I think it's a sixty, right. seventy dollars stock. Everyone, everyone I think it's a stock tip. It's a sixty, seventy dollars stock, and then I would look at it real hard to make sure they got their act together. Tell me one good thing that's happened since I left at that company. International's down the tubes. 
Transactions, traffic are down the tubes. Quality's down the tube. They've lost best place to work. They've lost ACSI. Service mm. stinks. Image stinks. Tell me one good thing that's happened to that company since I left. Stock's less than when I left six years ago. Who's the spokesperson now for them? Who did Shaq. Okay. Shaq Shaq's doing, out there doing his yeah. thing. Shaq's he, a good brand. He's got a high yeah, I like, He's uh, got a great QS score. Well, Q score. He does have a great Q score. I think he, he's a good ambassador if the product's good. I think he now is putting his name on a bad product. Mm, yeah. Now, like he this new Shaq bowl that came out. Yeah. The Shaq pizza bowl. That's got more bad product uh, for reviews. More uh, people have been on the uh, the Shaq Bowl than any product they've ever put out. They've got more negative. I don't think Shaquille is going to continue to put his name on. You don't think? I don't think he's going to continue to put his name on a, on wow. a fair product. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's a that's not good for Papa John if that happens. By the way, just so everybody heard knows, his score. Just so you know, run. Pizza Hut, thirty two minutes. So fastest, mm -hmm. not the best quality, but definitely fastest. Papa John, thirty seven minutes. Hey, Little like they didn't cut this pizza. They didn't cut the pizza. They didn't cut the pizza. If you're listening, can we get some napkins? What do you mean they didn't cut the pizza? They didn't cut the pizza. Yeah, they just roll it over. Lazy, so lazy cut. I got it. I got it. Who were the other two that were waiting for? Dominoes, uh, Dominoes, and Dominoes, Jets. And Dominoes and Jets. Yep. Yeah. Can we get a napkin? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Got this right here. That's another thing I think okay. they've done. I think they've changed the. It definitely changed the crust, but it doesn't taste the same. Some, yeah. I don't know if they changed the sauce, but something, something with the product doesn't taste. I got to tell you, I feel like we got to do something for our audience out there. We got to do some sort of poll, some sort of, some sort of lottery here, so we send them some pizza or something. I feel like we got to do this for the people. Ooh. I don't know, Pat. I'm just, Ooh. I'm a guy. I'm a man of the people. You know what? I'm really concerned. Talk about? to me. Twenty three. It's been 43 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's been 43 minutes. Where the hell is the pizza? We're about to, hit it. about to make it's a phone call. Here. Well, Domino's, when I grew up, if they, it was a half hour or less. <sighs> I'm tempted to what call is the, right I now. would like to know what the audience, either favorite pizza, who they go to. Did we do a poll? I'd love to send some pizza to someone out there. I don't know. Pat, you're the boss here. I'm just, I only work here. I only make the pizza here. You're going to send it to them. It's going to be, if they're local, come by. We'll give No, it. what do you mean? We I'm can taking... send it to wherever <clears> they're at. <throat> okay. So, uh... Are you impressed or no? The one from Papa John doesn't Pat. taste like the original pizza. Doesn't. They've changed the recipe. They've done something. I don't know exactly what they've done. I know they changed the dough recipe so they could make it softer to spin it out yeah. with the machine. Hmm. But that doesn't taste like our sauce. So I don't know if they if they went to a paste sauce or if they put something else in there. But it does not taste like the original recipe, in my opinion. This actually, these two are parity with taste. You know, just a question of, you know, they taste a little bit different, but not that much. But, you know, that zingy sweet sauce that always made Papa John, Papa John's. Yeah. I'm a, I'm, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, of course. Yeah, here, well, I'll let you try one. I'm going to try. Let me ask you, Papa John's used to have the garlic sauce, but then there was like a cheese sauce at some point. Wasn't there another sauce? Here. We have both. Okay, so this one's Papa John's. I'm going to give this a shot. Would you consider a cut or no? Not really. Let's see who's not next. Really. Somebody's coming in. Oh, Jets, Jets Pizza. pizza. So Domino's is last. Yeah. They, they won't deliver. What do you mean? Domino's won't deliver? When's the last time what, you what had What do you mean? Pizza. We called three different Domino's. With Papa John. And none of the Domino's that are in our vicinity. With Papa John. To this building. Wait, what? Really? I can't, I can't, I, the audience has to None of this. the three Domino's in the area refused to deliver So which to this Domino's, location. what cities were these in, the Domino's you called? You said Vero Beach. Are we? Nah, <laughs> no, no, I'll lower him a little bit, guys. He's a little too loud. Uh, but yeah, we called three in a proximity of our area. Yeah. None of them offered delivery to our address. We what? even went online to double check, and they won't deliver how to far, the how, how far was the... Three miles. Yeah, there's one There's one literally nine minutes down the road. And they said they don't deliver? Will not deliver. Well, Domino's, us. this is not good for you. So <laughs> what you just did, you just we're not going to be able to get a chance to... Maybe that's yeah, a good thing for test them. them. By the way, John, I don't want to offend you. You are absolutely right. This, this, it's hard to even get the slice out over here. It's falling apart. It was not cut well. Papa, this yeah, would not yeah, happen yeah, under yeah. Papa John's Well, you, you, That's why you got to measure what they're doing because they won't, they won't cut it. They won't bake it. And then what, what the franchisees, I love them to death, but um, you know, you're talking about successful entrepreneurs. They don't whine. Franchisees, they complain. But they'll make the product wrong, cook it wrong, cut it wrong, and then blame it on a marketing or blame it mm. on technology. I mean, it's unbelievable. You've got to measure what the franchisee is doing because if you're not weighing them every day and making sure they're on their game, they'll slouch. So what do you think about Jets Pizza that just came in? It's still a hot. 
He wants some jets. <laughs> Gotta tell you, it's a pretty big. Uh, this is pretty the first good time we're eating there. something on a podcast. I'll tell you, Pat, how you feeling about the sauce? To me, I'm heaven on earth, but he's the expert. I want to see what Pizza Hut is. No. This ain't doing it for me. It's not doing it? Which one is it? This was the Papa John's. This is not the Papa John's I'm used to. I don't, I don't know what they've changed. Something's different. Yeah. Straight up. When you got a winner, I don't know why you change it. Which one's mm-hmm. Jets? Who's your Jets? Okay, let me see the Jets works. Just grab a slice for me. I'm all good. I was in the military. So just grab me a slice. Rob Gargiulo, can you grab us uh, some napkins, buddy? All right. Oh, interesting. So different, uh, very different. Adam. Yes, sir. Thanks, PBD. Okay. It works. Let's see here. Jets is super hot. It's hotter because it's real. That's they make their dough in the, the store. I think Pizza Hut is a frozen dough. Papa John's has got the machine pressing it out, and then also Jets. That's fresh packed sauce. That's why it's a little bit more robust. I think Jet sauce is really good. I don't think it's as good as Papa John's. When Papa John's is Papa John's, but that didn't taste like Papa John's to me. Um, <clears throat> This place smells like pizza. Kai, grab a slice, Kai. I'm waiting for the pepperoni over Grab here. a slice, <laughs> Kai. Come grab a slice. Come on. Come on, everybody. Dog. Natalia, everybody wants you to grab a slice for whatever reason in the comment section. They love <laughs> Natalia. Here's what I think. I think if the Papa John pizza was made the way it was supposed to be made with the ingredients that it's supposed to be made with, I think it would hands down, it would kill the pizza. It's, uh, pizza. <clears throat> and my gut is, it would so. Jets pe- round pizza is not as good as its pan, but Papa John's round pizza is better than Jets pe- pan pizza uh, round pizza. But in this case, Jets is better because they're not ma- they're not making it right or they they stopped doing something made it differently. Um, but I think if that Papa John pizza was made the way we used to make it, it would it would clean this Jets pizza's clock. It's not made the way it used to be made, so I think this is a little bit better. Um, the pizza works. There's nothing on it. It's dry. It's no good. I think the Papa John works is definitely better um, than the Pizza Hut. And then I think the the Jets <clears throat> has a little bit more toppings and um, a little bit more uh, wholesome. I'd say it's slightly better than the Papa John's because they change the crust, they change the, the sauce. But um, I, I'd give Jets um, – Jets number one, I'd give Papa John's two um, on the – on the works, and I give uh, Papa John's and Pizza the two on the pepperoni, and um, and then I give Pizza the third on the, the works pizza. You, you, so for me, works is last. You know, <clears throat> we pass over that Pizza Hut pepperoni so we can send it over this way and get it to Kai. Thank you, sir. What, what are you, you ranking? The, the what, be- what are you the thinking? The best slice I've had so far was the original slice that we had out there from. That was was that Jets as well that Jets. With the pan the Jets, that was awesome. Jets has a fantastic uh, pan pizza. We got the round pizza. I don't think the round pizza is as good as Papa John's when Papa John's is made right. In this case, Papa John's was made right, so I think Jets is a little better. Okay, all right. Hi. Well, listen, Domino's you had a chance. So here's what we learned: <clears throat> if speed is the fastest. Pizza Hut won, 32 minutes. Mm-hmm. Papa John's was 37 minutes. Um, Jets was third. And then Domino's, we called three different places. They don't deliver, even though the closest one is three miles away. What's the criteria of how close? Is it like, uh, do, do you give it to somebody and then somebody else cannot have a Papa John's within a 10-mile radius? What's the structure? Yeah, great question. We do a seven-mile uh, delivery time. Seven, no, seven months, seven minutes. We like go seven, eight minutes. Okay. We, so you do it by drive times. So you may have downtown New York where 
you literally can drive five minutes and you have three main people, or you may go in, you know, Bedford, Indiana, and you may be able to go ten miles <clears throat> in ten minutes. But it, it's a it's a population um, drive time equation that you look at. Not miles. Totally makes sense. When somebody orders a pizza, how quickly is it made, and how long is it is it like too long to be sitting there? When you're running the Papa John store, <clears throat> everything's six minute intervals. You want it made in six minutes, you want it baked in six minutes, and you want it out the door in six minutes. Sure. And you know, try to get it to, to the door in, in six minutes plus the delivery time. So anyway, a little cushion there, you're at 30 minutes. So it's a lifestyle and a mindset and a game of six, seven minutes. Six, 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 six. The devil. Interesting. And if you were to make a pizza and you can p- pick between what's most important, the dough, the sauce, or the like the toppings, where if you had to have one of them needs to be grade A, and then like secondary, and then third. What would be the most important in order to like save <clears throat> the taste of the pizza as much as possible? Forty percent of your flavor comes from the tomato sauce. Your your cheese is really like a, a copper wire. It's a conductor. It's just a medium to for the flavor to mm-hmm. to kind of go through. Um, and to talk out of both sides of my mouth, the the dough is really the key. So <clears throat> I have a. a, a Actually, a pizza stone in my backyard, a pizza oven, mm-hmm. gets up to six, 700 degrees. Um, and what I'll do is I'll go get dough from Papa John's, dough from Jets, and then sauce from each of them, and just play. But I think the Jets pan dough with Papa John's sauce, and then this this pizza that you just saw, Jets, that's grande. This is grande cheese. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a thicker, chewier cheese. This is going to be... 280 a pound, whereas Papa John cheese is going to be $1.80 a pound. This is Loprino. This is a mm-hmm. lot cheaper. So if I could have a combination, if I could have Jets, Pando, Papa John sauce, and a combination of Loprino cheese with a little grande cheese, ah, you're home. Perfect. You're home. Let's the start chan- a business. What Let's are the start chances? a business. What are the chances Papa John's franchisees and board is watching this last part of the clip? And they're sitting there saying, guys, did you hear what Papa, what he said? He said, we recommended this. What are the chances they're going to actually implement the recommendation you're giving? The 280 cheese, the sauce, what's the chances? I wrote the book on how to do this. There's a book. It's called Papa. And they, they can't even read the book. <laughs> you know, I can tell you. what I, 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 they, they can't. I mean, they can't. You could, you, you know, <laughs> how, how, how do you get healthy? Troll. You, you eat right and you exercise. But they don't want to do it. Yeah. It would take... Where's that Papa John pizza at? <clears throat> it would take it, it would take twelve to sixteen months of going back in and keeping my hand on their shoulder. Mm-hmm. And twelve say, to eighteen months to get them back. It, it, you don't when you're selling a million pizzas a day and you got five thousand stores and they're all over. They're just out of shape. The the amount of fortitude. And exertion and energy on my part to get them back in shape would take a year. Mm. Every day on their case. No, no, no. I don't hear about marketing. I don't hear about technology. I want to know why you're why we're not making the product the way it's supposed to be made. The pizza. The pizza. It's as my farmer friend says at Modesto. It's the food stupid. <laughs> Makes the sense. Economy stupid. And by the way, there's a lot of us. I, I, can I just give a quick shout out? This kid over here. This guy Kai. By the way, he hasn't been on the podcast in. I don't know the last time. He's time. a little bit. Uh, yeah, he's I usually. He's, you know, we love this guy. This guy every weekend he makes his own pizza. That's his thing for years now. No, it's been a lot of years. Your yeah. permission to speak now. Go ahead, speak. Yeah, what no. you got? No, I dough from scratch everything. So it's been uh, it's been fun. Well, I've got uh, <laughs> I've got a pizza oven in my house in Kentucky. The columns that hold it up are 1,700 years old, back to the wow. Emperor Constantine out of the Roman Empire. That's crazy. So anytime you guys want to come, and you, you, when you all come see me in Kentucky, <laughs> bring Kai, and we'll make pizzas. <laughs> all right, I'm in. You, I'm can, in. you, you, can, film, you can film your show. Listen. You can film your show from a, the back my like backyard that. and have the time of your life with making pizza pizzas with Kai. With all due respect, uh, I'm going to let them go to Kentucky. I was recently invited to uh, Eastern Europe with Andrew Tate to go visit him in Romania. So after that trip, I'll maybe I'll come to Kentucky, but that's first on my list. So hey, Kai hey, can go get some pizza with those guys. Kentucky, I lived in Kentucky two years, so I I I, I uh, would actually entertain that thought. That'd be great. Thank you for the invite. Uh, appreciate you for coming out. 
uh, uh, this was great. This is the first time we've done uh, something like this. And this decision was made last second, by the way. Yep. I That's walked cool. in. I see him all the order and pizza. I'm like, are you okay if we ordered? He was you know, good enough of a sport to do this. And uh, once again, thanks for coming out. Thanks That's for great. sharing your story. Uh, any crazy projects you're working on right now? You haven't found that business yet. The we're, working on, we're working on Papa's Farms. Okay. Um, organic farm. No fertilizers, no chemicals, uh, little uh, beehives and, and bee farms. So we're having some fun with Papa Farms, doing a lot of things on nutrition. Just uh, got involved with a company called Wild Health, which is genomics, testing your DNA. Uh, but having a lot of fun in the health field. But I'll come back home when I get something that I really can get my teeth into and share with you. But I, I appreciate y'all having me. You, you look know, great, man. I got to tell you. I, the last the picture I thing. saw of you, I was like, oh, I hope he's doing okay. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, he walked in. I was like, holy uh, shit. He says, should I put a jacket on? I said, ah, no. 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 <laughs> you look come awesome. on down. Thank you. So appreciate once again, thanks for coming out, gang. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Give it a mm-hmm. thumbs up and subscribe if you did. And tune in again tomorrow. We have another show coming for you tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank you, Papa John.